to the Australian Herpticulture Podcast. I'm your host, Jason. And I'm your co-host, Luke. How you going, mate? Yeah, yeah. Going all right. A few little technical difficulties to start off the show, but you know, it's all good. No camera. <laughs> no camera. I'm looking at a blank screen. I can see it's recording, but that's about as far as it's going. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, well, there you go, eh? Yeah. So um, I was just, uh, yeah. So what's it, I said you said something about a stuffed up book order. What's the go with that? Is that that's me, isn't it? That's you. You had a stuffed up book order, not me. So I ordered a book, obviously, because you know we start off all these episodes about talking about books. And, um, <laughs> I thought I ordered a first edition, something that comes as body third edition. I was spewing. So, <laughs> so you scored a free book. Yeah, I'm not complaining because it's one that I don't have already. So it's going to be another one to start filling in my bookshelf. Yeah, but I did manage to find the first edition, so that should be coming soon. I've actually got quite a few coming soon. The missus is probably going to kill me when the deliveries start coming in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even talking about it with my wife. I'm trying to sneak him into the work address now. Oh, see, I don't have that option. I've just got front door and she's home all day, every day. So everything that comes no from the excuse. front door, she sees it. <laughs> oh, that's so, classic. But I, I um, have sold some recently, so it kind of makes up for it. So, so the book we're talking about, that's one of the Australian field guides isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Um, Swanson one, I think it was, we were talking about it last week. Yeah. Yeah. So you still haven't got the one that I've got with the Parenti on the front though, do you? No, I can't find that one yet. Yeah. A guest might have it too and offer it to me. So <laughs> he's offered yeah. me a doozy. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to have to take over that one. So might have to get a, get into that a little bit later. Yeah. But um, yeah, so it's interesting. What about you? you up to any, anything else, mate? Anything new? Uh, I've got to start a background for you soon. So yeah. I might, might get lucky and start doing a bit of foam gluing and stuff this weekend coming up. If all going to plan, I've got to go and get a COVID jab before I do that. So um, Yeah, I had mine the other day. Oh, yeah? To wait in line for four hours. Oh, that yeah, is killer. brutal. Started with two kids and then I sent the missus home. I was like, you go home and I'll wait in line. And when I get close, I'll ring you. And then when I got mm. close, she came back and we both got the jab. So, Man, what a nightmare, hey? Yeah. I mean, I've got the first one, so on to the next one after that. So, Yeah, I'm getting mine on uh, on Sunday. Going out to the Homebush, home bush, um, whatever it is, the Max va- Vaccination Center and line up. Apparently, they do pump them out pretty quick there, though, so. Yeah, it'd be better than my one. So I'm hoping it's quick. I don't really <laughs> want to spend my Sunday in a line. <laughs> well, yeah, that's why I spent my Saturday in a line. So anyway, oh yeah. Well, um, oh, I had to had to touch on a couple of things quickly. Did I? Yeah. See, did, you, did you see the um the photo I sent you the other the other day of my boys? <laughs> yeah, how's that? So I was just hanging out at home and then all of a sudden I hear this bit of a tussle and I walk into the bedroom where, where a lot of these animals are and then they're just like lying on the ground locked up like no tomorrow. So, yeah, they were good for, good there for about you know, half an hour, I think, they were spent locked up. It's a pretty decent new time. Pad, new pad, mate, and they loved it. Yeah, yeah, seal of approval. Yeah, that's cold. No, that's cool. Almost, almost felt like putting on some Barry White for them or something. But, you know. <laughs> Oh, why don't we bring on the guest, though? He's sitting here ready to go. So I can see our weather. guest. You can't. So. <laughs> no, I've got no idea what's going on. I'm just going to pour myself a whiskey and be done with it. <laughs> oh, that's what I should have done. I should have bought some whiskey now. No, I have to thank uh, Cooper's dad for his homemade hooch. It's uh, going to go down a treat after today. <laughs> I keep thinking you're talking about something else every time you say that, not whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could show you the bottle because these cameras are stuffed up. It's literally in a wine bottle with a bit of masking tape on it saying, whiskey, Luke, enjoy. <laughs> and that's it. So <laughs> That's awesome. Some Australian yeah, no, whiskey for you. Yeah, exactly. Probably made in a bathtub. I don't know. I trust Terry though. It tastes good. So that's all I can say. <laughs> that's I'll you let you mean, introduce mate. this guest before I run this show off the tracks. No, nah, you're right, mate. Oh, well, anyway, everyone's probably knows who the guest is now because it would have popped up in the show. But um, we got Matt Somerville back. How you going, mate? Good, fellas. How are you? Good, mate. Good. It's been a day. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, if, if anyone doesn't know Matt, I'm pretty sure you do. We've had him on previously and we were talking about herping. But um, I think this time around we're going to talk about keeping venomous snakes, something me and Luke don't really have too much 
knowledge in really so it'll be good to come basically we'll be almost like the beginners talking to someone with a little bit more experience than us so mm-hmm. <laughs> complete newbies yep you oh you've got the out. you've got the tree snakes they're mildly venomous if you yeah. allergic to them but <laughs> well matt would have still laughed those off i'm sure yeah, exactly <laughs> <laughs> i've got nothing to even say to that <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll leave that with you <laughs> well you're doing better than me so <laughs> Oh, that's gold. Well, do you want to give us a brief rundown on kind of, you know, basically how you got started into Venomous? Did we touch on that last time? I can't remember if we did. I know we touched I on roughly what I can't remember. Had. Yeah, we talked about little bits and pieces of what I was keeping and yep. me not keeping as much as yes, I used to. I think that was pretty much that. it. Yeah. yeah. So I did keep a lot. I don't keep so much anymore. I got started – Oh. Probably, I don't even know now, late teens, I guess. Yep. I've always always liked venomous snakes and that sort of stuff. I've always liked reptiles, obviously, but I sort of just had this draw to venomous. Yeah. Mostly, mostly from herping, to be honest, just because I grew up with red bellies and brown snakes and all that sort of stuff. And they just interest me more than something like a carpet python or a children's python or something along those lines. So I always kept bits and pieces, and then once I could legally keep venomous snakes, I went and through the whole process of getting my license to be able to do it, and I just fell into it very, very hard because I've got a horrible obsessive personality. That sounds like all addic- of us. Become addicted <laughs> to things. That sounds so very familiar. It went from having something like a couple of death adders and a couple of red bellies to at one point I had 120 adult venomous snakes. Yep. Which was just stupid when I think about it. Like I enjoyed it at the time, but it's so much work. Like 120 elapids is so much more work than 120 pythons. Oh, for sure, yeah. Like they're, they're shitting all the time. They eat a lot more. They obviously they put on a bit of a show when you're trying to clean a lot of the time. Yep. So it got it got old. I was doing as well like – breeding a fair number of things and sort of just trying to go down the path of trying to breed species that hadn't been bred too many times before and getting them out there into the hobby. And then the whole, I think we talked about in the last one, the whole venomous cap came in in Queensland and I got capped at much less snakes than what I had. So I downsized greatly, sent a bunch out to different friends and then sold a few. And then Luckily, I'm a zookeeper, so I got to take a few things to work as well that I didn't want to get rid of and just yep. kept them there on loan and they're still there. That's oh, pretty that's lucky. Awesome. Yeah, so I didn't have to give everything away. Yeah. It was still hard. I still really struggled to get down to 20 snakes. That's, oh, definitely. that's difficult. 20 yeah. venomous, that is. Yeah, because I had a lot of sort of little projects going on as well, like yep. projects in my eyes of just different colors of different species and mm-hmm. – my Ingram's brown snake thing I've been doing for years and years of growing them up and trying to figure out how to get them feeding properly and breeding them. And then I bred them last year and then I ended up with more than what the cap was and just that whole drama. One clutch puts you over straight away. Yeah. That's the worst part. Can you kind of explain to us how the license works up in Queensland? Because I know down here we've got different like levels of license. So you've got your basic basic um reptile then you got your advanced and then you start getting into your venomous categories and there's certain species in those categories that you can keep basically you can't just jump to like an eastern brown you've got to kind of work your way up there is that similar yes. up in Queensland? yeah yeah so it's changed it didn't used to be like yep. you could go and get your venomous permit and go and buy an inland or a coastal tie tomorrow if you wanted to no <laughs> dramas at all whereas just not last year i don't think the in 2019 it changed Yep. And now there's a tier system. So I think once you jump up to your venomous permit, you can keep red bellies and spotted blacks for, I could be wrong on this because it doesn't apply to me. So I haven't been too, I haven't looked into it too much, but I think it's 12 months. And yep. then you jump up to the next tier, which is a few other black snakes, maybe death adders, tiger snakes, that type of thing. And then you go up to the, the tiers and then eventually you get to coastal taipans inland taipans and for some reason the same as new south wales rough scale snakes are in the top tier which makes no sense to anyone because they're not on the same level as those snakes yeah but 
that's just how it's always been. I'm pretty sure Queensland has just copied New South Wales and yeah, gone down okay. the same path to make it so people aren't jumping in. I think it came as a result of there were a few bites. People were getting in a bit over their head, as we probably all know. Yeah, A lot of people get into venomous snakes for the wrong reasons as well, mm-hmm. for, for a selfie on Insta or free handling photo on Facebook for some attention or something like that. And, yep. yeah, bites occasionally happen. Bites aren't common at all, but they do happen. And, yeah. obviously, the government's got to make it look like they're doing something to mitigate that risk. Yep. So yeah. So that's sort of how it went. The rough scales are on the last category in New South Wales. Yeah, and yeah. same with Queensland. I'm fairly certain. Yeah. Yeah, which I don't know why. They're yeah, not okay. on the same level as a Taipan, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah, because I think just I've just brought up the species list on my phone. It's um, a brown, it uh, Eastern Browns on the top one as well. Yeah, Eastern Browns, um, Speckled Browns, Taipans, and Inland Taipans. Okay. So, and obviously uh, um, Rough Scalds as well. And that's that's yeah. your last. Oh, and your um, uh, Weigels, Brown Snakes. That's, that's, it's weird. It's, Almost when you see those lists, it's like someone in a department's just gone through a field guide, flipped through the pages and just gone, that one, that one, and that one can go yeah. on that list. Yeah. And Yeah, I don't know where those lists have come from. but So, so your sounds pretty pretty well similar to ours. Um, but, yeah, your um, tigers, um, jugites, and mulgars are all on the one below R5. So we've got like a basic, um, which is R1, R2, R3, R4, R5. Yeah. So, and your adders are on R4 as well. Okay. Yeah, well, it, it doesn't apply to me. I got yeah. my <laughs> license well before that came in, which I'm very, very lucky for. So, yeah. I've sort of just been able to what, do what I want for the last 15-odd years. Yeah. So, do you have to do like training courses and so on to become – like as I know, I'm pretty sure here you've got to go do like a venomous handling course and then have, I've, you know, experience with certain – Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty training. sure it's pretty similar to most most states. Yeah. Um, these days I'm pretty sure they require a handling course. There used to be you had to do a first aid certificate. I don't know if that still applies. It does in the zoo industry, but I don't know about privately. Um, I've got my first aid certificate and usually two references from people that have either worked with venomous snakes or kept venomous snakes for a certain period of time. If you've got two reference letters to say that, yes, you've got the experience that usually helps you go a long way as well. That's how I got did it. When I got mine, I got two references and that was pretty much it. That's all I really had to do. I had to prove that I could keep the animals safely in locked rooms and locked enclosures and that I had the right first aid equipment and that I knew what I was doing and yep. handed the license. Yeah, that's. I'm pretty sure that's exactly what you've got to do here as well. I mean yep. – it's good in a way because it keeps people that probably don't have the experience out of getting that category of license because you like everyone knows how kind of easy it is to get your license in the first place. You just fill out paperwork and you can get it. So yeah, yeah, you know, it kind of keeps those people out of um, you know getting into something, biting off something more than they can chew, so to speak. Yeah, which I'm sure definitely happens. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. No I mean, there's probably still ways around it, and it's probably still happening anyway. But you know. Yeah, yeah, you're not really going to stop it at the same time. But I've noticed as well, like I haven't been it in, I wouldn't say I've been in it for a long time, but a lot of people come and go very, very yeah. quickly. Yeah, A lot of people come in, all of a sudden they've got 20, 30 elapids, a whole bunch of coastal tires and inlands and red bellies and that sort of stuff, and then they just vanish. They sell yeah. them all down the track and you can sort of tell what's happened in that scenario. They've got something that they're terrified of and that's it. Yeah, they've gotten rid of it again, or they cop a bite, and that scares them off. Do you reckon that maybe, but, yeah. maybe like some of them that might still love the animals for the animals and be doing the right thing? Do you reckon they suffered like a little bit of a burnout too, if they are such a demanding type of animal to keep? Yeah, yeah, oh, definitely. I know I've definitely suffered burnouts when it comes to keeping that many animals, that many venomous snakes. Sometimes you just want to chuck it all in and just give yeah. up because it's just it's just a pain in the ass. You walk yeah. in to your front door and all this, the house smells like it's shit. <laughs> and you know, you've got to be, on your, gonna be good. And yeah. You've got to be on your toes all the time too. That's the other thing. It's not like, you know, you pull out your jungle python and it bites you, you know, it's just at the end of the day, it's nothing. You know, if you pull out anything out of those and it happens to tag you, you know, you're in a bit of trouble. So, 
Yeah, but in all honesty, like I've had jungle pythons that are way worse than <laughs> half the venomous snakes I've kept. <laughs> They're bastards like, I've of had things, people, things. I've had people come around and I've been showing them the collection and I'll grab a whole bunch of stuff out and show them like brown snakes and whatnot and then go and grab the hook off the wall and get a jungle out. <laughs> So I've I'm, not putting, I'm not putting my stickers. hands on that thing. <laughs> yeah. I've heard that from a few people. I, I trust a lapids way more than I trust most pythons. Yeah. There's usually a lot more warning before that bite comes. Yeah, right. I suppose it's one of those things, the more you work with them, the more kind of you kind of, kind of learn some body language and that kind of thing. So Yeah, and the, the danger, like they are dangerous. I'm not going to deny they're dangerous, but I think the danger is also grossly over exaggerated a lot yep. of the time like these animals these snakes aren't trying to bite you yeah, yeah that's right every now every now and then you will get an asshole that yeah like will go out of its way to have a crack at you but even if it's given the option it'll bugger off and get away from you mm-hmm. yeah most of them especially i found in captivity is they chill right out really really quick they realize that you're not trying to hurt them and they'll just i've had that many brown snakes that are just like pieces of rope that you yep. can do anything with because you're not stuffing around with them and hitting them with things. And I think people also have issues with that when they keep venomous as well is because they are not so cool, calm and collected with them, or they're a little bit scared, which there's nothing wrong with being scared, but they, they're so rough when they're trying to pull something out of an enclosure with a hook that the snake starts freaking out. And then you make things worse for yourself because yeah. it's cornered, it's bouncing off the walls and you just got to leave. When a snake's doing that, you just got to leave it alone. Do you think there's also an element of complacency as well that could factor oh, yeah. into bites as well? Like Yes, yes. You know. Complacency, definitely. I know I've gotten very complacent over time and yeah. complacency leads to bites. As they say, complacency kills. Yeah. So complacency comes in and people do get very, very complacent with them. I think people get complacent with most things. you sort of got oh, to definitely. tell yourself that this animal can kill you. Yeah. And sort of always have that in the back of your mind. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that that goes with anything with complacency, though. Like even driving and everything. So you could see how that could easily be one of the main factors to why people do get bitten in a way. I suppose it's probably also stupidity as well. Yeah. Well, um, most people that I know that have been bitten, like in the industry and privately and that sort of stuff, it's always been a complacency factor. Yeah. It's just simple things like reaching in to get a water bowl yeah. Yeah. or turning their back for a second. Um, I've seen a case where someone, the snake was underneath the paper, like bouncing backwards and forwards and its tail popped out and they went to grab its tail. And as they went to grab its tail, its head come out and they grabbed it by the head instead of the tail. <laughs> yeah, right. Things like, and the snake didn't even bite them, but yeah. that's how people get themselves bitten. Yeah. Reaching in to grab things or, yeah, the water bowl one's a good one. Yeah, reaching in to grab a water bowl, and as we know, snakes get very food orientated right. when you reach into enclosures. And a lapids are no different; they'll come tearing out and grab the first thing they see. And if that's your hand, yeah, it's not a, not a good time. Yeah, I can only imagine. Yeah, it's a bit diff- <laughs> bit different to getting grabbed by your carpet python, or I'll stick to my little lizards. Anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> In saying that, though, the worst bite I've ever had from anything was from a bloody scolaris. Spotted tree monitor. That doesn't surprise me though. A lot of varanids do have some pretty nasty teeth and they do leave, leave a bit of I a sting. A, I got a massive bone infection and oh, it destroyed me for two weeks. I could barely move. Wow. Yeah, right. Lost, like all, the, the finger lost all the feeling. Yeah, it bit me on the finger. Just a tiny little thing, like bite on the finger. And within two days, everything was just all red and swollen. I couldn't move anything. Went in for to the doctors, CT scans. And yeah, I had a bone infection and infection in the tendons, and it was it was brutal. Wow. Yeah, and th- and then I had allergic reaction to the medication they gave me, which made it even worse. Oh, geez. That was yeah. So yeah, I'd rather cop a venomous spider over that again. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> was it? I say that was, now. Was it a big? Yeah. Was yeah. it a big lizard? No, probably. Oh, like a subadult scolaris, yeah. probably your know, total length. 35 centimetres ish. Yeah. yeah, right. Yeah, not not big. And the bite didn't even hurt. Like it was a little tap and that was it. Well, just managed to hit you in the right spot. Yeah, just got me and I just didn't wash it or anything and it went rank. Man. And go down here real quick too when you start getting infections in the bones. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you need those things. 
Um, yeah. <laughs> so just to kind of, well, I kind of dropped out there for a second. Did you guys kind of have a rundown of what sort of a lapids you're keeping now, Matt? No, yeah. no. I think we started with how I got into it. Yeah. Now I keep Ingram's Browns, strap strapped, strapped snouted Browns, ringed Browns, Barkley Death Adders, Speckled Browns, and I think that is it as far as the Lapids go. Still a nice little variety yeah. considering you're That's limited it. to 20. That's yeah. it. Yeah, so at one point I had pretty much every larger Lapid you could keep. I've kept them all now except for Spotted Mulgars, Butler Eye. Yeah, okay. yep. The only species I haven't kept. Um, so yeah, I've still got a few things like brown snakes and like a big mulga and stuff that I had at work. But yeah, I just keep 20 now, what I can yeah, keep. Yeah. Sort of just had to knock down to my favourites. I mean, the vast majority of those are Ingrams. Do, do you kind of think that like getting knocked down to twenty was a little bit of a blessing at the same time? Yeah, hundred percent. I wouldn't even change it now. At the time, I was pissed. I yeah, because I did had to get ri- get rid of a lot of animals that I'd focused on things I'd grown up from babies, and growing up baby brown snakes is not an easy task at all. <laughs> um, so I'd grown them up, got them past that point of no return and kept them going and and then all of a sudden I had to get rid of them all. Yeah, that'd be yeah, hard. Which was a bit of a pain. And I was trying to like see what colour forms were coming out of certain adults when you paired them together. And because the colour variability is so insane with some of these species, especially things like Nucalis and Mangani, they one female will lay 20, 22 eggs and every baby will end up looking different. Wow. wow. They'll all come out the same but... Once they hit 12 months old, every single snake will look different. And I was just trying to figure out why things yeah. like that were happening. And because brown snakes as well, when they hatch, they've all got the black head patterns on them and some grow out of it and some don't. Mm. But the head patterns are slightly different shapes as well in some babies. So I was trying to see if there was like correspondence on how one head pattern would then move into an adult snake. Yep. Like see if it the shape of the head pattern meant that that snake was then going to have a black head when it was an yeah, adult. Okay. And I was slowly getting there with it and then I just had to get rid of them all. Yeah. So I just, I've got all this data that means nothing really now. Yeah. I never really figured out what was going on with a lot of them. So that was yeah. a bit of a, that was a sort of a kick in the teeth. But at the same time, 20 snakes is much more ma- manageable for me now. Yep. And it meant I could go down that path of, natural keeping and natural enclosures and that type of stuff, which is what I was leaning to anyway. And I was at a sort of a point where I was like, how the hell am I going to fit all these snakes in natural enclosures and give them what I think they deserve? Yeah. Yeah. Cause now I think back at it, like I was keeping them like almost like battery hens. So we keep really. it all in racks back then. Most. Yeah. 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 Like 90% of what I was keeping was in racks. Like yeah. those vision, vision racks. Yeah. Yeah. And I had a few in natural enclosures, like I had a big eastern brown in a big natural enclosure and a few other bits and pieces. My ingrams have been in natural enclosures and my speckled, that type of stuff. But the vast majority were just in tubs. And that was for my own ease of cleaning more than anything else, especially yeah. when I was keeping black snakes. Like I don't keep black snakes anymore. I never will ever again. But they're filthy. <laughs> they just – they will turn – they will turn – yeah, they'll turn a – 150 gram rat into three kilos of crap over the next couple of days <laughs> and just spray it everywhere. and just spray it everywhere and they'll be covered in it and yeah so I, I got over that very very quick but in a tub you could clean that up quite easily in an enclosure yeah. that's a nightmare yeah. did you just have multiple yeah. tubs and basically you know have a clean tub swap the animal into a clean tub put away and then clean the dirty no ones i or? usually just i would pull a tub out put the snake in a, in a i just bin. have a wheelie bin in yep. the snake room put the snake in the wheelie bin f10 the tub scrub it out um, put it back in. Um, I used to keep things on paper and then I went to keeping everything on Aspen and I, I liked keeping things on Aspen just because it, it sort of kept the smell at bay yeah. a little yeah. bit. And But for certain snakes, it works well. For things that are crapping all the time, you you go broke buying Aspen yeah. because you've yeah. got to replace the whole tub every time you want to clean because yeah. they won't just take this nice little dump in the corner They'll take seven of them around the tub, crawl through them, and then bury themselves in the aspen, 
and you just the whole aspen's brown by the end yeah, of it. Yeah. Yeah, I don't So what kind of no, you're right, you're yellow. I was just going to say, I don't miss walking into a, a room full of racks and smelling snake shit because you've got them all on butcher's paper. Yeah, exactly. And when you do have it on butcher's paper or newspaper or whatever, it stinks yeah. Yeah. really and bad. Especially and especially if they shit near the heat too. Right? Oh, yeah. yeah, exactly. And <laughs> a lot like of those species, <laughs> some of those species, especially like when you keep mulgers, they will turn your paper into paper mache in a day. <laughs> yeah. they'll, push it, they'll push it all into the water bowl They'll shit in it, and then they'll push it to the hot end of the tub, and then it'll solidify <laughs> up in that area. And it's just, it's horrible. And then you'll get because mulgers are stupid. They will, and then one of them will try and eat it, <laughs> because, it because it smells like something. It's what they ate? <laughs> you'll, yeah, you'll come in and they'll have it halfway down their throat. And you've got to try and pull it back out again. Well, you're gonna to need to turn this conversation around because you're not really selling the fact that these things are good to keep. <laughs> <laughs> I just want pe- people to know what they're getting themselves no, into. Very yeah. true, very true. <laughs> the, the venom's the last thing you've got to be concerned yeah. about. <laughs> yeah, the maintenance sounds like hell alone. It's the, it's the maintenance, yeah. But keeping them in natural enclosures, like even if you can get it to a point of bioact- bioactivity, which is really hard with a venomous yeah. snake, it's got to be a very big enclosure. Um, we have done it at work. It works, but you just got to do it. You got to be on top of it. I haven't done it at home to the point where it's been completely bio- bioactive. They've they've either failed or you've got to clean them at least yep. once a week. You've got to at least take particles out yep. to yeah. try and keep on top of it. And it only works for certain species. Like yeah. if you wanted to keep something like a big two and a half meter king brown in a bioactive enclosure, that enclosure would have to be four meters long and have substrate two feet deep and have a billion isopods and springtails yep. living in it to keep on top of it yep. because they are messy but we do have a enclosure at work that is i'd call it partially bioactive with a big mulga in it but it's three and a half meters long wow yeah, yeah it's a big enclosure for some you still have to clean it yeah for someone that's looking to get into like venomous what would you say is kind of like a, a good starter like start, start a snake. With. Yeah. This is one, this is probably one of the most common questions I ever get asked. And most people will usually say red bellies yeah. are the starter because they are quiet. In all honesty, in my opinion, get whatever you like the most. There's yeah. no point getting a red belly or a spotted black or a tiger snake if you really want an eastern brown or yeah. a common adder or something like that. But you've got to know what you're getting yourself into at the same time. You can get some pretty fiery red bellies. Yeah. But at the same time, they're nothing compared to a fiery eastern brown when they want to carry on. So yeah. you do sort of need to get yourself or we'll know what you're getting yourself into. But, yeah, there's no point getting a snake if you don't want it. I guess that's Which, where that, you know, working with someone that's that's kept them for a certain amount of time, you kind of get to learn what, you know, kind of characteristics some of these snakes have. Yeah, yeah. And I found these days as well there is a lot of people that get into it when they've never had anything to do with these snakes before or yep. they've just seen someone holding a red belly online and gone, oh, I really want to get one of those, but they've never had anything to do with them. They don't really know anything about them. I find the people that are like, I don't know how to word this, not saying they're the best alapid keepers and the best handlers, but it's usually the people that have grown up their whole life obsessed with snakes and yep. they've taught themselves on wild snakes beforehand because in my opinion the best way to learn is on wild snakes even though you're not supposed to touch wild snakes it's illegal yeah. all that sort of stuff but most of us did it when we we're young and that is the best way to learn and you do know what you're getting yourself into it and those people usually end up in it for the long run because they know what these snakes are like yeah the other people that have sort of just gone fallen into it at a point are in and out very very quickly i'm not saying they're all like that because i know people that have never had anything to do with snakes until they're 30 odd years old fallen in love with the lapids and they're awesome keepers yeah. awesome handlers but it's it's different for every person so yeah to answer the question whatever snake you like the best but now that there's a tier system you kind of have to keep a black snake to yeah. start with to prepare yourself and to me a red belly teaches you nothing about keeping an eastern brown an eastern brown teaches you nothing about keeping a death adder a death yeah. adder teaches you nothing about keys, keeping a toast, coastal type end. They're all different to each yeah, other. Exactly. They all behave very different. They all handle very different. Uh, 
yeah, that's that's it really. Yeah, no, that makes a bit of sense to a degree. Yeah. Ad- adders are the easiest a lapper to keep, hands down. See, they're probably my favourite, the adders. But, but they, um, they lure people into that false sense exactly. of security because you never, you never have to touch them. Yeah. And they just sit there all the time. They never show anything. And then someone reaches in and they get to grab a bitten. water bowl or something. Yeah. yeah. So that yeah. makes perfect sense. See, I've I'd, always loved adders, but yeah. Yeah. In my opinion, anyone with a little bit of common sense can keep a death adder quite easily yeah. until you get to the point where it has a bad shed. And then yeah. you've got to get something like a bad sh- retained shed off or an eye cap you've got to get off or maybe your snake's got an infection in the mouth and you have to take it to the vet and a lot of vets won't see venomous snakes. I'm lucky yep. up here they do, certain ones do, but you're going to have to head restrain that snake when you get there. And if you yeah. don't know how to head restrain something like an adder and they're not the easiest snake to head restrain, like a red belly is a lot easier, um, that's when people sometimes come unstuck. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, you've always so. you got to get to the point where you're prepared to be able to do anything, everything, with any yeah. snake you keep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly right. I mean, There's a lot more to it than a lot of people realize. Oh, definitely. Yeah, that's what I mean. That's personally, I've never gone down that path because you know it's I I love venomous snakes, but I wouldn't. I don't feel comfortable handling them, so to speak. Yep. So that's why I just it's not my cup of tea. I mean, I'll happily sit you know look for them in the bush sit at a distance take pictures of them but it's just not my cup of tea to handle them so i yeah, just don't trust myself at the end of the day yeah there's a lot of people you know? that are in that mindset as well and then you do get a few people that love venomous snakes but they want to get one and then they don't want to touch it yeah and they think yeah i get those messages i used to get them a lot i don't get them so much anymore but someone will say i'm gonna get such and such venomous snake but i'm just gonna put it in enclosure i'll put a little box in there like a lock box and let it go in there, and then I'll clean the enclosure each time. And you always say to them, what happens if that snake does manage to get itself out of the enclosure or yes. you do have to take it for some sort of health check or it has a bad shed? Because guaranteed one of those things is going to happen at some point. Oh, yeah. yeah. Especially the retained shed one. That's such a common thing, especially coming into winter months if your humidity is not correct. Some species are shocking when it comes to not shedding properly. Um, yeah, and you might. it's even something as simple as an eye cap. You can't just leave that on there. No, that's right. It's, just, it's going to go horrible in no time. Yeah. And I, something... I teach that as well to people at work when we're training them. Like you need to be able to handle every one of these snakes at their best and at their worst and you need to be able to fix all these problems. So, yeah, don't think you can be hands off all the time. Yeah, that's exactly right. And that's, yeah, I mean, do, do you use those lock boxes at all or? No, not at all. No. Um, I can understand why people do use them and it is mitigating risk as well. Yeah. But at the same time, people rely on them too much. Like I was yeah. saying, they wait for the snake to go into the lockbox and then they clean the enclosure. And like I was saying, okay, eventually you're going to have to touch that snake yeah. Yeah. and something bad's going to happen. And yeah, certain pla- certain people use them a lot. Some zoos have been leaning towards using them a lot more. In my opinion, as someone that trains people on handling venomous snakes and stuff, I don't like them because they just give people a sense of security. Yeah. No, that makes sense too. I mean, I can see, I can see arguments for both sides of those. Yeah, another one I've well. noticed as well when people are using lock boxes as a lot and they're not handling the snakes as much, like they sort of lose their handling ability to an yeah. extent. You're not like on your game handling almost. all the time. Yeah, it's it's a skill to a point. Yeah, but if you're not doing it all the time, you sort of you get nervous after you haven't yeah. done it for a couple of months or whatever. And if you're using lockboxes all the time, you're not handling the snakes. And I've found with a lot of the snakes that anyway, once you're handling them a lot, they get used to it and they quieten down. Yep. Not always. It's not a rule, but it's pretty common. You get those some especially if you're a, Especially if you're a – yeah, there's always assholes that never, ever calm down. Yeah. Definitely got had my fair share of those. But, <laughs> yeah, I, I just like to be on my game and to know that I can handle whatever I have to at any point in time. Yeah especially when I'm teaching people how to handle venom snakes often. Yeah, that makes sense though too. Um, yeah, I I can see, but yeah, I see both sides of the lockboxes. But um, like you said, if you've got to put, if you get to retain shed, you've got to basically know how to mm. hold that snake at the end yeah, of the day. Yeah, lockboxes have their place, but you can't rely on them. That's yeah, kind of I mean, I, I could, yeah, I could see why like certain like zoos and stuff would kind of lean towards 
using it them because at the end looks of the good day, oh, HS wise exactly. as well. That's right. Yeah. So it's like, you know, they've got like tick boxes and everything they've got to mark mm. off basically because it all comes down to insurance and everything else as well. So it kind of makes sense for zoos and all those places to use them. But like you said, if you're not using for handling, yeah, but it's, it, it's, I wouldn't take to say, well, it technically probably is a skill. It's one of those things, if you do anything, if you don't do it after a certain amount of time, you're not going to be as good at it. If you yeah, I, it I find if I haven't months. if I haven't handled in a while, I don't I don't get nervous, but I feel like I just get this feeling of I haven't done this in a while. Yeah, am I going to be able to do it? And then once you do it, you sort of just you remember straight away. It's like riding a bike. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. it's a skill, and I think it's a skill as well that I used to think it was a skill that anyone could learn. Like people are always going, "Oh, he's so good for handling a venomous snake." You're not you're not good for handling a venomous snake. It's just something you learn over time. And yeah, I used to think that anyone could learn to do it, but now that I've trained people to do it, I've changed that too. Most people can do it. Yeah. There's, Some yeah, people there's should never be allowed near a venomous snake ever. Yeah, that's right. Or any, or any snake at all. Yeah. Yeah. And mate, yeah. Um, so to just kind of go back to, you know, your housing and stuff, you kind of touched on, you know, using a lot of racks when you did keep a lot of venomous. Did you have some sort of like preferred housing housing for your adults? Like size wise, or what, like what I had in yeah, the what I had in the tub? like like type. You know, did you prefer keeping a lot of your adults in racks, or do you actually prefer keeping them in bigger, you know, vivariums? Or I I prefer nowadays I prefer keeping them in enclosures, like decent size enclosures yep. that are pretty natural. But for ease of cleaning and maintenance, I preferred keeping everything in racks. Um, I find they're easy to get out of the racks yep. as well. Yep. Usually, often. They're so food obsessed that as soon as you open the tub, they launch out at you straight away, thinking they're going to get gonna fed and, and end up on the floor or whatnot, which makes them easy to get out. Sometimes I've even shown people at work put the bin in front of the tub and open it up, and they'll launch and fall straight in the bin <laughs> straight away, <laughs> which works sometimes. But yeah, it was just easy to get them out of a tub. There was nothing for them to wrap, wrap themselves around because they will try and hook themselves around anything. Often you'll knock a water bowl trying to get over trying to get something out because they'll try and wrap themselves around that. Yeah. But as far as like having stuff in the tub, I, it was just a hide at each end, just usually a plastic hide, which was also easy to clean, a water bowl and substrate. That was it. Yeah, nice yeah. and simple. Yeah. yeah, whereas now the enclosures are very elaborate and it's hard to get the snake out if you need to. It will wrap itself around absolutely everything. There's upright trees, grasses, yeah. holes that they can go down, They'll, they'll trash an enclosure trying to get them out, which can be frustrating. But to me now, it's worth them. It's worth it seeing them in something like that as opposed to a plastic tub. Yeah. But you can't yeah. even see the snake anyway. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. So when you open the tub, were you using a hook to pull the tub over? Yeah. Yeah, most yeah. of the time. Depends on the snake. But usually safety-wise, safety wise, you'd use a hook to pull it open. Certain snakes, the ones that I knew that were really foodie, I would use, I'd have to use a tub and they just stand back. And move yep. away, and they would come launching out, and yeah. usually just catch themselves on the edge of the tub with their tail and just swing underneath it, chewing on everything they can see because they think they can eat it. <laughs> yeah, I've seen videos of people living in tubs and just yeah, yeah, they come out really quick. Yeah, so most of the time it was that sort of thing, just to keep your hand away, or you'd stick your fingers underneath the lip of the tub so you could pull it out that way. But yeah, most of the time, pull them out with a hook was the safest way to do it. That way, you're not going to get yourself bitten by accident. Yeah, I do I mean, the same thing with most of my pythons because the same thing. They'll just yeah, launch exactly. out and try and grab whatever they can see. <laughs> yeah, no, nah. it's just a habit I got into, which was a good habit, I think. Definitely, definitely, yeah. Because I've seen numerous videos of guys opening tubs and just the launching out, like the yeah. speed they can move is just oh, it's nuts, crazy, it's crazy how something with no arms and legs can fly at you. Yep. Yeah, with precision too. Yeah, so, and they will just chomp on anything they can see. And yeah. then once they hit the floor, sometimes they'll chase your feet as well because they think it's food. If there's <laughs> if there's rodents in the room and they can smell them, everything's fair game. Yeah. What type of um, vivs, if now you gave me vivs, do you prefer? Are you making your own ones or are you using? I, I build my own. Yeah. Yeah, they just, most of them are built out of either melamine or plywood yep. a lot of the time and just painted. That's all I use now with just sliding glass doors. That's yep. my preferred thing. I just build them myself because they, I can fit them exactly where I want them. 
yeah, that's type handy. thing. I don't have to get an exact four foot enclosure and squeeze it in somewhere. I yeah. can fit something that's three and a half feet into one area and something that's six feet into another area. And yeah, I can build them exactly how I want them then. It's most yeah. enclosed. I find most of the enclosures as well, they don't have big enough lips at the front. So you can't have deep substrate a lot yes. of the time. Yeah. And it, or you've substrate so close to your tracks that the animal's just pushing dirt into your tracks all the time, which and you can't open I hate. Yeah. 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 You can't get your door open. Yeah. And it makes that yeah. annoying sound every time you open yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I hate sliding glass. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what, um, so when you're in your enclosures, I was just reading one of Luke's questions. He asked, um, like for heating, are you using direct overhead heat? Obviously with your tubs, you were using. Yeah. LED. Tubs are all heated with heat cord. Yeah. yeah. Um, in enclosures now for everything I have, either a halogen globe yep. or one of those Arcadia deep heat projectors, which yep. I'm a big fan of. I like them. They heat. Yep. They don't put out a huge amount of heat I've found, but yep. I mean, I'm in cans. That doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, but they do quickly heat up the surface below them. Like if you stick your hand underneath it, I find it's not putting out that much warmth. But yeah, if you okay. touch the surface, like most of my enclosures, well, I, I keep slate in things so it absorbs heat and radiates heat and that sort of stuff and also the animals seem to heat up a lot quicker underneath them even though they don't feel as hot as something like a light globe i have found that the animals get warm under them a lot quicker and they bask a lot lot less yes i've never used i see as i see as a positive they're expensive but they last for ages you probably spend that much in light globes yeah and what what they would what the deep heat projector would last for i actually what type of wattage are they um, 50 and 80, the yeah. Arcadia ones come in. I think, um, oh, what's the other brand? There is another so one. So Ecotech a, and... That's the one I'm thinking U, of, Ecotech. And URS also do them. So they do them in 50s, 75s and 100s. But in comparison yep. to a lot of the globes out there, you know, like if you're buying a globe, let's just say, for example, from an actual pet shop, you might be paying, like, let's say, I don't know, 10 to 15 bucks for a light globe. It, it, it's like what? Between thirty to forty dollars for one of these deep, deep heat projectors, like they're not that. Bad. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, for the Ecotech ones, I'm pretty sure they're that cheap. The Arcadia ones are a bit more expensive. Yeah, but um, I'm I'm pretty sure they're they're the exact same thing. They probably come out of the same factory. They do. They just got a different colored silicon on them. Yeah, exactly. So I yeah I use them, and then I have everything paired with um, T5 UV as well next to it that's not on for as long usually it's only on for my heating depends i adjust my heating depending on the time of the year in a lot of my enclosures and some things are on thermostats and some things aren't on thermostats depending so and then the uv will probably come on from most of the enclosures at 10 o'clock in the morning till two to three in the arvo yeah and then i'll have some sort of visual light paired with that as well be it a jungle dawn or those, I think they're Har- Harv Max, Harvey Max or something like that, grow lights or even just bunning shop lights, something yeah. that lights up the enclosure and stimulates a day cycle, day-night yep. cycle. So I'll have all those things yeah. in an enclosure. What sort of basking temp are you aiming for for most of these species or are you kind of varying depending it, on species? It varies. So most of the time I'm aiming for something like 35 yep. as, as a hot spot. Some of them will get to 40, 45 yeah at where the basking spot is, but then it'll be 30s around it. And often yeah. the snake won't sit at the very hot spot. It'll sit on the edge of it a lot of the time. Yeah, I'm not aiming too much for certain basking temperatures. When I was keeping things in tubs, everything was 33. Yeah. 33 yeah. and that was it, warm spot, and the rest was just ambient. So now because lights are on full ball for certain periods of time, it will get very, very hot underneath it. But I'm not I'm not keeping exact measurements of exactly how warm they're getting, but most of them, yeah, sit around that thirty five to forty right under the light. And sometimes snakes will sit under that as well for a short yeah. period of time. Which my, I remember a few years back that was just ridiculous to let a snake yeah. get those sort of temperatures. But it seems to work. It's worked for me. I think as long and as you can, you've got a sorry. Yeah, right. I think as long as you can give an animal like a proper gradient where they can get away from that sort of stuff, you'll be amazed at what they actually will use. Yeah, well, the rest of the enclosure is ambient, yep. so yeah, exactly. which in summer is stupid up here anyway. <laughs> the whole the whole enclosure is at 30, 31 degrees. They've got no other option, which is why I don't keep temperate animals anymore either. 
Yeah. Because they, they do suffer over time. They just they can't well get cold. Here. Yeah, and, and <laughs> certain snakes, like southern snakes, they're a lot harder to breed up here. Yeah. You just can't get them cold enough over winter. Yeah, that makes sense, yeah. Yeah, I, I had, I've had that issue with a few different species where I've struggled to get them cold. Yeah, yeah. I, just, I suppose that's like, that's one thing you don't really think of being in Cairns is the nighttime, like we were discussing before. The nighttime temp doesn't drop as much as it does in basically even Brisbane. Yeah. No, like it sometimes won't even drop below 20 in winter. Yeah, that's crazy. So certain snakes, like I don't do it for lapids, but certain pythons, I, I have to put them outside in winter in enclosures out on the back deck to try yeah. and get some cool air through the enclosure just to breed them. Yeah, so you don't have obviously have an air conditioner or anything in your room or to no, no no not in that room I don't yeah no no that's fair enough but um a few years back I um I bred tiger snakes up here yeah and air conned their enclosure for all of winter <laughs> wow just just to kind of prove that you could do it oh, no, there was always obviously. this thing going around that you couldn't keep tiger snakes in Queensland and blah 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 I mean you can you just got to do it right. Yeah. Keep them, just give them that cool winter and don't let them get hot all the time. The humidity they don't do well with. But if you can give them cooler temperatures, they do all right. So what we did is put them in this, put them in this melamine enclosure, hooked up a box aircon to the end of it, insulated yep. the whole enclosure with um, foam, and then put the snakes in there, turned the aircon on as low as it would possibly go, closed the doors, and didn't open it again for two months. <laughs> didn't even, didn't do anything. And then, Next thing, had a gravid, gravid female and a whole bunch of babies. Jeez. That's a... so, so it worked. Yeah. A lot of effort, but it worked. Yeah. Yeah, it worked. So it's, 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 you know, that's a, a, another species you can tick off, I guess, that you've bred. So <laughs> <laughs> That's heaps of work, really, if you think about it. How yeah, did you it was with, a lot of work. I suppose where they're from, though, that's a bit more drier, though, isn't it? So the aircon would have dried out obviously your enclosure yeah the aircon dried the like the humidity was down to something like 10 percent in the enclosure yeah. didn't seem to bother them they had a big water bowl in there it was i didn't even change the water which i'm sure people would scoff at that as well but they the snakes didn't move they just bunkered, bunkered down, down found spots to to hide didn't come out and then once they got started getting warmed back up again they mated like they would in the wild yeah and they had fresh water again and they were good to go yeah oh that's oh well it's pretty good. Yeah, so it worked. <laughs> so with with your keeping too, like, are you have you got safety measures in place as well? Um, yeah, I do. The ones that you're meant to have, like my my room is locked, yeah. which is escape proof. Oh, your enclosure supposed to be locked as well. Like each yes. enclosure has. Yeah, yep. so enclosures have to have locks on them. Which with a rack, you can um. Put a, put a bar down the front of it with padlocks on each end and that none of the tubs can be pulled out. Um, things like hashling tubs, sometimes you'll have to put them inside a bigger enclosure or if they're on a, a rack, like I just use those Bunnings racks for hatchlings, yep. Yep. Those, racket, those racket racks, and you can just sort of put doors on the front of them that lock and that type of thing. It keeps keeps all the hatchlings in there. So that, that works for them. And then safety-wise as well, I have a first aid kit in the room, bandages. If someone gets yeah. bitten, there's a little poster on the wall that says how to put on a pressure mobilization bandage and the door's got a sign on it that says venomous snakes in this room, do not enter. Yeah. And the and up here as well, your room, your windows have to have security screens on them or bars to stop someone from breaking in and getting themselves bitten by one of your snakes. <laughs> I think it's funny that you've got to stop yep. someone breaking in. Yeah, you've got to out. stop someone breaking in. <laughs> that's ridiculous. Uh, yeah. yeah. Man, that's, yeah, that's, you know, if that's stupid. So it's just that in. sort of stuff. And, yeah, different people I'd say, I'd say have different ways of doing things. Like yep. some people when they deal with venomous snakes pretty much put on a bomb suit to be able to do it. They've got their gloves and their boots and their jeans and all that sort of stuff. Um, at home, I'm pretty loose. <laughs> must be safety boots no no shoes I'm, I live in Cairns I don't ever wear shoes <laughs> yeah, so yeah, it's too hot for that sort of stuff I don't even I know, wear shoes uh, when I go herping yeah I know the boys <laughs> commented on that on um, NPR I think it was NPR on one of the shows I was saying yeah, I don't yeah. In thong. yeah I don't ever wear shoes unless I'm at shoes. work yeah, yeah same I hate wearing shoes me it's too thongs. 
So yeah, I, I, just, I don't wear shoes or anything like that when I'm cleaning. Yeah. I've never been bitten on the foot, touch wood. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can hear Nipper uh, Nipper Reed calling us all bogans right now like he did. <laughs> he sent me a message earlier calling us bogans. So uh yeah. I'll 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 take that. I am a bogan. <laughs> That's <laughs> we're Australian. It's good just in our blood. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So um Maybe we could touch on like what you actually feed some of your your vans and whether or not you actually do a bit of a variety. Yeah, I'm all for varied diets. So mice, rats, quail, chickens, uh, that's pretty much all I can feed them really yeah. legally. Yeah. Um, in the past, I have fed them other bits and pieces like lizards I've had die or snakes that I've had die and that sort of stuff yeah. or youngsters that aren't thriving, which I know is frowned upon as well, but... Certain species do really well when they're fed other reptiles. I've noticed that over the years as well, especially yeah. things like mulgars that aren't naturally rodent eaters. Yeah. They just they just look better when you feed them reptiles a lot of the time. So I have done that, but most of the diet is rats, mice, quail. Yeah, okay. Um, I do feed day-old chickens, but I'm not a huge fan of the mess it makes <laughs> okay. at the same time. <laughs> not enough bone. Eventually, no, eventually... I guess their system gets used to it a little bit and yep. they firm up a bit. But, yeah, there's not that much goodness in a day-old chicken anyway. They're pretty much just yolk. Yeah. 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 A quail of the same size is way better. Quail's yeah, one of my favourite things to feed things. I think they're way better than rodents. I, See, I've never, never fed quail. I've noticed mm-hmm. that a lot recently because I've got a my, my leaf python. He's like strictly a bird eater and in my yep. opinion – his like body ratio and everything is perfect. Oh, yeah, I was going to say, does he just look nice and lean yep. and muscular? Yep. Yeah, and yeah, not just a fat mess like fat, most yeah. olive pythons. Nah, like he doesn't get that crinkle in him wherever and stuff. And now this year, I'm kind of going. That's what you want, man. Once I get rid of all these rats, I think I might just start buying bulk birds. You know, it just seems to be the way. Yeah. And quails, it's getting easier to get now as well. It's not as expensive as what it used to be. Yep. Um, some places they are a little bit harder to get. But, yeah, I, I prefer quail. I like it. I think animals look better when they eat it. They're just better muscle tone because, as we probably all know, the vast majority of captive re- reptiles are fat. Oh, yeah. Like definitely. Bordering on morbidly obese and people think that's okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah, no, I think I – think, I mean, you – You go, James. Right. Well, I was just going to say, you see some of the snakes in the wild and they're like – you'd honestly think they're almost dead. Yeah. yeah, compared to a lot of the captive yeah. red snakes, but you know they're not; they're healthy. Yeah, yeah, that's more so how a snake is meant to look. Yeah, yeah. I recently got sucked into the trap of feeding my mangrove monitor a lot of a lot of mice and rat pups and stuff like that because I just had stacks of them on hand, and I started just noticing. I was like, "Man, this thing's getting super chunky," you know, like it's he's not supposed to be like this. And I've since kind of made up these like pre-frozen packs of. Um, Food for him, where there's, I kind of feed him like one of these things once a week, essentially. And it's got like a, it's got a prawn, it's got a scallop, it's got a, a slice of fish, it's got a like a little rat pup or something in there. So it's like a like a complete variety. But I've got it there frozen, so I can just kind of whack a whole bunch of food into him quick. But at the same time, it's a, yeah, and that that's a way more natural diet too. Yeah, well, they're foragers, right? Yeah. A lot of these animals exactly. Are. And I and the same thing. Like I think the same applies for most large monitors. People just feed them so much. Yep. And they're not eating huge feeds every time they eat, no. and they're not they're not eating every two or three days. Yeah, some of them are probably going weeks without yeah. food, especially in like dry, deserty areas. Like Parentes aren't eating every bloody day, the and when they do, find, the picnic areas. Yeah, yeah, yeah look at them. <laughs> All those sausages. Yeah, they're a, yeah, yeah, they're a picture of health as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, it, but most things, most of those large monitors are just wandering around, and like they'll pick up. A centipede here, a baby bird here, or whatever they can get. And yeah, mangrove yep. monitors, like where they live, most of their diet is probably crabs, fish, crustaceans of some sort, yep. insects. Um, those mangroves up there are full of um, like tetellas, gahira, yep. geckos. They're probably eating a lot of those as well, which are very lean. It'd be pretty rare that they'd eat a rat or a mouse. Yeah. yeah. They'll eat. They'll eat a melamese, which is like a rat or a mouse because they're in the mangroves as well. But I don't know. They're always very, very lean. 
they're not fat, that's for sure. But it goes back to what you were saying about, you know, the varied diet that you were feeding your venomous snakes is, and, you know, the difference that you're seeing when you're feeding leaner things like your, you know, reptiles that aren't going to make it or, you know, a few birds and stuff like that. It makes your animals actually look normal, you know. They do and they breed better as well. Yeah. Like I used to be in this mindset that everything had to be like fat to be able to try and produce decent clutches of eggs. Yep. It's amazing some of the clutches of eggs you'll get out of very, very lean females and they're usually better. There's less slugs. The eggs have got more calcium in them. You don't get windows and that sort of stuff in them. They just look better all around. Yeah. I think that might be one of the reasons why people had a lot of hard time breeding olive pythons as well is because they just feed them on rats and mice and everything else. So Get them as fat as they possibly can. And yeah. yeah. Thinking, yeah. you know, all that extra weight would benefit but at the end of the day it's probably doing a detriment to the animal i remember seeing it over some facebook groups um you know years ago when i first kind of got into the hobby where everyone would be trying to race towards that two to two and a half kilo mark with their carpet pythons you know as soon as they got them to just try to get them up to size to breed and you're just like oh man like i look back at it now and i'm like that's such a bad mentality to have yeah i I look at it as well and i used to do things like that as well yeah we're all guilty of it even with venomous snakes like certain species i'd hatch them out and see how quickly I can get them to adult size. And, oh, the growth rates of some of these snakes are insane. And they died when they were four, four or five years old. They just dropped dead. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's um, the same with green tree pythons too. Everyone's like, it's got to be over a kilo to breed. Like, yeah, I um, oh, years ago had a spotted black or a whole clutch of spotted blacks that I hatched out and one male just started feeding straight away, so which is pretty rare for them. And so I just kept feeding him and feeding him and feeding him and he fathered a clutch at eight months old. <laughs> oh, man. That's a small yeah, snake. I'll, I'll, yeah, you think he, maybe, oh, he was like three foot oh, long. Sorry, I meant like a young snake, you know. Yeah, like, oh, but yeah, that's the youngest I've ever bred anything. Do you and, think um, that maybe they could still breed at that age in the wild anyway, even if they hadn't? I suppose they probably would. Well, I guess they could if they got to that size. I said, yeah. He proved that he could do that, but I don't know where they'd ever get that much food especially rodents yeah but this thing was on adult mice by the time it was six months old from tiny pinkies bloody hell yeah yeah so So, um why don't we touch on a bit of breeding venomous snakes and basically like cycles and and everything else don't do it (laughs) (laughs) if you're smart don't do it yeah yeah, yeah, the the, the next thing is feeding feeding hatchling (laughs) venomous snakes i can only imagine how hard that would be so the breeding part's not hard. Um, it's not that different to pythons a lot of the time. Some species are, but most yep. of the common ones, commonly kept things, taipans are super easy. They're the easiest venomous snakes to breed. You put them together, they pretty much breed. Yeah, It's just getting your times of year right. Um, certain things are winter breeders. Certain things are spring breeders. Like taipans, you'll usually pair them in July, August, early September Yeah, type of stuff. And then if you're breeding like, let's say, spotted blacks or collets it's a bit later you might put them together september october as it starts to warm up and a lot of the time it's based on the temperatures in the area where they're found yeah so if like taipans are found or coastal taipans are found where it's warm all year round most of the time so they will breed in winter because they can still move around whereas certain other species just could become completely inactive in the winter months and they'll breed when spring comes around and um like adders will go a little bit later certain adders won't go till november a lot of the time it's just finding those times but when you do put them together and you've got a good male you're going to breed them yeah that's with most species um certain ones have been a little bit harder uh like i said with the tiger snakes they do breed well down south they're a bit harder to breed up in these areas yeah um even anywhere in queensland like brisbane that sort of stuff and i'm sure copperheads are the same i've never bred copperheads but they'd be pretty similar. I'd kept peninsula browns for a long time, which are just from the air and the York peninsulas in South Australia where it's bloody cold most of the time. And I tried for years and years and years of all these different things and I could not get these things to even mate. The male just showed no interest in the female. And then last, not last winter, the winter before, I turned all their heat, like no heat at all over winter, turned it all off and kept the pair together from March, it was. Yeah, March all the way through to December. Just didn't even separate them at all. And the female later clutches slugs. 
Yeah. That was the closest I ever got. And then my mail dropped dead. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so, I sent I sent the female off to someone else after that to have yep. a go. So you cutting feeding as well, obviously. I didn't or... yeah, barely fed for that whole period of time. I don't feed any of my stuff really through winter. Yeah. Even though it's not getting that cold, I still give them that cool down period. Most yeah. will still most stuff will still slow right down and just go through that natural cycle anyway. Yep. Every now and then I might chuck them a little bit of food if they're looking like they're interested. But most of the time I don't feed my snakes from May through to I actually fed everything yesterday for yep. the first time because it's gotten hot here in the last few days and everything was out looking for food. Yeah. So I chucked them a feed and a few things still refused. Yeah, right. I suppose, yeah, because we're, we're starting to want quite a bit here as well. So Yeah, and then you'll get to that period where the males are starting to show interest and some of the boys won't eat and some of the boys will eat. Some of the yep. girls won't eat the whole time they're gravid and some of them will eat up until the day they lay. just depends on the snake a lot of the time. Yeah. And um, obviously, they're just laying their eggs and kind of leaving them in lay boxes. You providing lay boxes and stuff. I give, I give just... lay boxes. They're just system of tubs with a hole cut in them and yep. full of sphagnum moss. And they use it ninety five percent of the time. Every yep. now and then, you might get one that lays under a hide. Or I've got a ringed brown that I've got to take the water bowl out when she's due to lay because guarantees she'll lay in the water bowl every <laughs> single time, even though there's a box for her, and just destroy a whole clutch of eggs. Yeah. Which- it's not the worst thing in the world either. It's usually a blessing. But, yeah, most of the time they'll use those lay boxes. The female will stay with the eggs for usually 24 hours-ish. Yep. She'll just sit there sort of wrapped around them loosely, not like a python coiled around eggs, but she'll loosely sit there. I don't know if they're guarding them or not. I don't think they are. I think it's just exhaustion. Yeah, okay. I, think just, I think they're just absolutely buggered and can't yep. move. So they just sit there. Most of those snakes are so wrecked after laying the clutch that you can just pick the eggs up amongst them without even worrying about the snake moving. She'll just look, yeah, okay. sit there and look at you and you can pull eggs from right next to her head a lot of the time. Yeah. I wouldn't recommend it, but <laughs> you can you can you can do it. I'm sitting here yeah. going, bugger that for an idea of fun. <laughs> <laughs> I was Some, literally sometimes while they're laying, most of the females will go into a trance and you can just pull eggs as they're laying. Okay, so yeah. Because they, they will they will stick together as well. They'll clump together, not Again, not like a python where they're all pushed together, but they'll all stick just, to each other, yeah. Yeah. which which can be a pain as well. I like to get them before they stick together. Yeah. What um what sort of temps are you incubating um, eggs at? Is I that kind incubate- of a common temperature for all species or you've got different temperatures? For I've different been experimenting species? over the years with different things. Um, I think everyone for a long time was just incubating them the same as python eggs, like 30, yeah. 31, 30.5, that type of stuff. I've been slowly lowering lowering my temperatures to see if it makes a difference. Yep. Most of the time I go for 28, 27, yep. 28. No dramas. Everything comes out healthy as they just take longer to incubate, yeah. which is yep. probably a good thing. And I've tried over the years fluctuating temperatures as well, which yep. I think is probably a good thing because eggs don't stay the same, which I think yeah, I've heard exactly. you guys talk about in the past. Eggs go yeah. up and down yeah. temperature-wise. So I've done that sort of stuff. I've had... One clutch I had dramas, the rest have had no dramas. The only reason I had dramas with one is I incubated a clutch on the shelf in the snake room over summer and the temperatures yeah, went right. from the temperatures went from 25 degrees at night to like 40 degrees during the day yeah. and just kept going backwards and forwards because we had a bit of a heat wave and I got a whole bunch of deformed babies out of that clutch. Yeah, right. Like what, yeah. spinal kinks and everything else? Or? Uh, spinal, spinal kinks. Um, short tails was another one and crooked heads. So the snake wasn't in a direct straight line. It would get to the neck and then the head would cock off like, to the side. Wow. So that type of stuff or irregular scalation on their face. Like instead yeah. of having three scales under the eye, they'd have one giant scale. Yeah. Okay. That type of stuff. So, and some of those babies, like I kept some of them alive just to see how they went and they were, they never thrived. They were yeah. destined to die. From the beginning, they weren't. They shouldn't have ever hatched. Really, yeah. have have you found any like with when incubating with certain temperatures at like like temperature sex determination? No, with any not, that I've, not that I've not that I've noticed. No, yeah. no. Usually, most of the time, I'll get a pretty good ratio of about fifty fifty males yeah. to females if I hatch a whole clutch out. Um, in saying that, though, I got three Ingram's cr- clutches last year, and out of the three clutches, I got one male out of all of them. Uh, sorry, yeah. one female, which was 
horrible because everyone wanted girls. <laughs> um, yeah, one female and I think eleven boys. Wow. Yeah. What sort of clutch sizes are most of these species laying? Is it kind of it would vary, I'd imagine, but it varies yeah. a lot. So things like strap snouteds, easterns. Um, the bigger brown snake species, or even smaller ones like Westerns, Mangani, Nucalis, yep. they will lay 20, 22 eggs. The most I've got out of an Aspidorinca was 25 eggs, which is a pretty big clutch. Yeah. Uh, and then the smaller browns, like ringed browns, will still lay 7 to 12 eggs. And then Ingrams are, Ingrams are a big snake. Like a big adult male Ingrams can be six foot long. But oh, yeah. The biggest clutch I got last season was four eggs. Yep. Yeah. That's, yeah. That was it. But they're huge eggs. Like the females look like they're going to explode up until when they're laying. And you're like, oh, God, I'm going to get so many eggs here because I'd never bred them before. Yeah. And then I just got four gigantic eggs that were like eight centimeters long each. <laughs> just these real long, skinny, irregular things with pretty big babies that come out of them. What sort of like so those eggs? What sort of sizes are those hatchies coming at it? Like, weigh, did you ever weigh any hatchies, or did you I, just I weigh all my hatchies? Yeah. So something like a eastern brown is about eleven grams when yep. it comes out. Ringed ringed browns are one gram when they hatch. Oh yeah, and about the size of a matchstick. Jesus Christ! Yeah, they're shocking. They're tiny, but then taipans like coastals. 20, 20 plus grams when they come yep. out and 35, 40 centimetres long straight away. Mm-hmm. So it varies from snake to snake. Like yeah. certain adders when they're born, like they don't hatch out of eggs, but when they're born, things like Cryptomydros, the Kimberley adders, they can curl up on a 10 cent piece. Wow. They're really little. But then like snakes like Barkley death adders will come out at 20 centimetres long and 12 grams. Yeah. So it varies a lot from snake to snake. Yeah, there's yeah. lots of different sizes. I can tell you that getting one gram snakes feeding oh, that is was, a nightmare. <laughs> that was going to be one of my next questions <laughs> about getting hatchlings to feed and establishing hatchies. But do you ever yeah. have to like actually assist feed these things as well? All the time, oh, all the time. Man. There's lots and lots of assist and force feeding for the first. I see few a lot months. of that on on the groups. Yeah, like the, there's the very the few groups. very few lapids that will eat food straight up when it comes out. Often, often when I get a clutch, like if I get, say, 20, 22 clutches, uh, eggs out of an eastern brown or a jugite or something like that, usually each clutch you'll get one or two that will eat pinkies straight up in every single clutch and they're, they're the best. They're the snakes you keep yeah. and hope that they then pass that on to their offspring, which they often do, which is good. Yeah. And in their clutches you'll get five or six that'll eat and so on and so forth. But most of the time you're assist feeding um force feeding i used to assist feed a bit it's just it's so much of a stuff around you're putting food in a snake's mouth putting it down spits it out and you're repeating it over and over and over again i just went through a stage where i was just force feeding things until they actually ate for themselves yeah and you get quick at it too you can do 100 hatchy browns in i don't know two hours just sit on the floor pinning shove food down shove a pinky down its throat keep going and then eventually eventually they learn to eat by themselves yeah, what are you pinning the hatches with? Like when you I use a potato doing... masher, <laughs> <laughs> a plastic, like the, the plastic, a plastic ones. Plastic potato masher is my go-to pinner for hatchlings. Yeah, right. I'd be so are scared you just of pinning with that. Yeah, I I was in the beginning. I, I'm pretty good now at knowing exactly how much force to put on something. Yeah. I've never squashed one ever, but you feel like you're going to sometimes, yeah. especially when you start doing it. You get to a point where you know your exact pinning technique. And how to pin something. It's the same when you're doing adults. Like if you're pinning for milking or anything like that with adults, you get pretty good at knowing exactly how much force to put on things so you don't crush them or hurt them. Mm. Yeah. So with the hatches, are you pinning them and just keeping them pinned with your potato masher and then force feeding them? Or are you actually no, so pinning I, them? I pin them, with the, pin them with the potato masher, grab them behind the head with, you can only use two fingers, like a finger and a thumb. Yeah. Picking them up and then pinky on forceps and then slowly pushing the the pinky down the throat and, and then just and then just and then just massage it into their stomach with your other hand. Yeah, and how then do do down with the next one. Snake the size of a matchstick. 
I, I don't even know. Um, <laughs> you're not yeah, well with something that size. You're not giving it pinkies either. I'm force feeding them pinky legs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So oh, I'll, yeah. I'll chop the legs off a pinky and give them two two pinky legs each, and just push that down their throat. But at the same time, you've got to push it down foot first, not thigh first, because the bone is sticking out of the thigh. And if you yeah. stick that down, you can rupture it. You can rupture something on the way down. Mm. Yeah. So you've got to be careful of that sort of stuff as well. And also some snakes will fight back, obviously, because you're shoving a mouse down their throat. Browns and that aren't too bad. Um, black snakes are shocking. They've got really strong jaw pressure and they'll just chew on things as you put it in their mouth and the pinky will just get obliterated. So you've got to be quick as well guts at the same time. Real. But then you end up with guts all through the snake's mouth and you end up yep. with guts in the snake's glottis as well and they can suffocate from that sort of yeah. stuff. So as soon as I start getting a pinky that's – the guts have exploded out of it. I just pull it back out of its mouth and yeah. and start again. And usually I'll have like a spray bottle of water. I'll just spray the blood out of the snake's mouth to try and yeah. clean it up a little bit. Yeah, it's a process. It's like a production line. <laughs> and I suppose that's something you'd want to kind of be in the right frame of mind to to attempt as well. Yeah, you don't want to come home from work after someone's abused you and then no. be thinking about it and then have to force feed 50 brown snakes or 100 brown snakes or whatever. Okay. Yeah, you got to be in the right frame of mind to do that sort of thing. I used to just have a night a week set aside where I'd just get home and sit on the floor of the snake room, have all the tubs around me and just be in the in the zone and just smash them out. Yeah, things like adders are easier because adders you can tease feed. Like yep. You can sort of tap them all across the body with the pinky on the tongs and eventually you'll get in a defensive strike. And if you sit still enough, they'll eat the pinky while you're there, but you've got to sit very still. As soon as you move, they'll often spit it back out again. So often yeah. you'll be sitting on the floor with 20 tubs around you, just sitting as still as possible. And, of course, that's when you get itchy or pins and needles or yeah. something like that. <laughs> and then just waiting for each adder to eat its pinky. You usually don't have to force feed adders, which is nice. Yeah, okay. You can get them to a point where they will tease feed. Yeah. And every now and then you will get one that won't even strike at anything and you you have to resort to assist or force feeding them. But. How do you, what size are the fangs on some of the hatchy adders? Because adders have large fangs. Oh, about a mil to two mils. They're not yeah. very big on the hatchies. Yeah, okay. Enough that they can bite you, that's for sure. Yeah. And obviously longer than some of the brown snakes. Yeah, the, the brown, brown snakes, snakes you, can't even fan, you can't even see their fangs when they're babies, yeah. but they can still bite you, that's for yeah, sure. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Man, I could just imagine but yeah, that. I've, I've never been bitten force feeding, that's for sure, which is good. Yeah. Yeah. It's always when you feel like you're going to get bitten, but it's never happened. Yeah, I could just imagine like trying to trying to restrain something so small, trying not to hurt it. Yeah, trying to get yeah, food. trying to hold it behind the head with the right amount of pressure so you're not yeah. squashing its head while it and won't it's not eat. Gonna... So yeah, it's you're trying to get it to eat and it won't eat, so you feel like squashing its head. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what a fine dance you're playing. Yeah. 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 So I did that for a lot of years. Yeah. And just for yeah. For who knows why, very little reward, that's for sure. <laughs> and raising them, you're obviously just keeping, like you said before, in plastic tubs. Yeah, on, system of tubs. Yeah. yeah, all in system of tubs, a hide, water bowl, paper. That's yeah. it. Until How do you go moving hatches on? Is that? Um, it's, Cause it's, obviously a pain, the, it's a pain in the ass, to be yeah. honest. Because obviously, like, you know, if you breed bearded dragons or whatever, like a lot more people keep bearded dragons than they keep venomous snakes. So if you're breed, breeding clutches of... 20 brown snakes. Yeah, so if you, you know. breed 20 western browns in a season, you've pretty much flooded the market straight away yeah. with those. And you'll spend six months getting that thing feeding voluntarily yeah. and then someone will tell you they want it and they'll tell you they want it and they'll tell you they want it until it comes to the day that's ready to go and they go, oh, no, nah. mm. wife said no or yeah. my dog died or something along those lines. My car's broken down. I can't afford it. Yeah. And the, and the snake's worth nothing anyway. They're like, couple hundred bucks if that yeah for six months work it's just not worth it in the end yeah not not many venomous snakes are worth decent money yeah because what yeah I, like i know obviously there's a, the morph markets with pythons and stuff and that stuff kind of fetches high dollars but you know you see see them advertised that they're, they're not worth much really. no so well red, said, red bellies are probably the most highly desired venomous snake from what i see and yeah. they're they're 250, 300 bucks, if that. Yeah. Yeah. Even Colette's, like everyone wants Colette's because they're bright red. Yeah. 
and yeah, like four or five hundred dollars for a hatchet, yep. and a lot of work to get that thing to actually eat. Yeah, yeah. Whereas a lot of the adders, fifty hundred dollars. Yeah, it's not much. You de- you definitely don't make money breeding venomous snakes. It costs you a hell of a lot more than what you'll ever make. That's for sure. Yeah, it's definitely. What a about thing some you're doing of the mutations? Love? Yeah, you like do it that. for the love. That was the only reason I was doing it for the love of it. Yeah, it's a stick love, but did it for a long time. <laughs> Were you trading a lot of stuff as well? Like if yeah, something yeah, you I wanted. would I would much rather swap something with someone. And often yeah. I would just give things to friends. I'd yeah. Say, do you want this? I've grown it. Eats. Do you want it? That type of thing. And then like, yeah, yeah, and then they'll help me out with something a year or two later. I'd much rather trade things. Or there was a point there where I was breeding, um, like big numbers of things and then just sending a whole clutch to someone like venom supplies, send them a whole clutch of brown snakes or a whole clutch of ring browns and then they can use it for whatever they're going to use it for down there. And that's much easier. Yeah. Yeah. Than dealing with it myself or dealing with reptile keepers. Yeah. And what about like morphs and that? Because there was a few albino um, tiger snakes and that floating around at one point. Yeah. There's been a few albino tigers over there. Yeah, there's been a few albino tigers over the years. Um, I don't think anyone's ever managed to breed them or do yeah. anything with them. I'm pretty sure they're all dead now. Yeah, because there's um, one sca- in the front of one scaleless of Scaleless adders. Scales. Yeah, scaleless adders were just a, a shit show. Yeah. Uh, a few people had them. A few people tried them. I think someone bred Hets at one point, but they were so like fickle and finicky that the adults just never thrived. No scales. Yeah. I've heard stories of people feeding them a rat too big and the snake split in half like a sausage. Yeah, right. Yeah, and there's there's albino adders getting around. They're probably yeah, the most. Yeah, well. they're the most healthy morph. Yeah, I I used to keep them years ago. I bred them a couple of times. Um, my male would get eye infections constantly if I kept him on anything except paper. As soon as I put him on substrate, he just get these horrible eye infections. So yep. I have to move him back onto paper. I got rid of them eventually. And a mate, a good mate of mine breeds them, breeds albino adders every year, perfectly healthy. No dramas yep. with them at all. Easy to breed, easy to get feeding. And there's a pretty high demand for them. I don't know what they're worth. I think yeah. they're still only a four or $500 snake, even though yeah. there's not, not that many of them kicking around. But, I mean, even albino Darwins are still worth that price and there's heaps yeah, of them exactly. right now. So. Yeah, and a lot, of, a lot of these snakes are nowhere near as common. They're way harder to breed, way yeah. harder to raise, but they're just not worth the same dollars as the non-venomous snuff, which makes yeah. sense because they're oh, not as high in demand. But, but at the same, same time, At the too. same time, you've got this feeling in the back of your head like the amount of effort it went into this thing, it should be worth more. Mm. Yeah. And in definitely. other countries like over in Europe and the States, some of these venomous snakes are worth a fortune. Yeah. Because, again, there is a big, there's a bigger market for it. They can't get them. Yeah. And people will pay for something that someone has put the effort into raising. Yeah. As well. It almost seems yeah, a little exactly. bit like um, like the frog hobby to me. You know, you, you it, whilst they might, some of them might be a little bit easier to breed and feed and all the rest of it. Like, there's a hell of a lot of work that goes into frog breeding, and then you, you know, selling these things for twenty, thirty dollars, if that. Yeah, I've done that as well. Yeah. That's not a fun experience. That's why I brought it yeah, up. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a that's a lot of crickets. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of money's Small in crickets. a lot of money's worth of crickets of pinhead crickets. You know how quickly crickets grow as well, so they're useless in a couple of days yep. and die, and they die. Yeah. yeah, and you've got I can't remember how many we had like two hundred dainty tree frog tadpoles at the start of the year, or metamorphs, and yeah, they're just so hard to get feeding and grow, or not hard to get feeding, but just hard to grow and then hard to get rid of. And mm. yeah, I think spent more on insects in the long run. Yeah. Than actually, what was made out of the frogs, which is a shame, really, right? Like, if you know, if you turned it around and you made each one of those instead of being twenty dollars or thereabouts, and you made them a hundred, hundred and twenty, or something like that, then at least you might be breaking even with your costs to kind of warrant doing it. Yeah, but no one will pay that. Then. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's obviously the other thing with the tiered license system as well. So. You know, the higher up in the tier, the probably the harder it is to move on. That's probably why. Yeah, well, I, like I noticed said, the last season gone, yeah, the last season gone since this tier system's come in, that there's all of a sudden a huge demand for red bellies and spotted blacks. Yeah. And I was, I don't keep spotted blacks anymore, but I used to, I used to breed a lot of spotted blacks and I used to struggle to get rid of the clutches when I did. That was, yeah. I would get to the point where I was just giving them to people. And yep. now I see them pop up for sale for triple the price of what I was charging for them. 
and they just gone straight away every single time. Yeah, yeah. makes sense because obviously, yeah, now that, that tiered system's in, yeah, well, all of a sudden people can't keep things that they really wanted, like yeah, like coll- collets and tiger snakes are really popular as well, but they can't keep them on that first tier. Yeah, what are collets like? Are they feisty or are they kind of nah, a little bit the, more? No, oh, so you get the odd feisty one. The ones yeah. I've dealt with, they're usually pretty chill a lot of the time. Like we, we've got a few. Right? Yeah, we've got a few of them at work, and they um, two of them are quiet as anything. Yeah. You do anything with them. I used to keep them at home. I'm not a big fan of them. I think they're really overrated. But they look, <laughs> they look pretty. Awesome. They look yeah. pretty. That's it. Yeah. They're, yeah, they're just another – they're a black snake. They're just yeah. – they shit all the time. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love some of the brown snakes, some of the colors on some of the brown snakes. Yeah, well, browns is what what my passion is. What yeah, is it I the Meng Den- Meng Denai? Yeah, Meng Denai got like, is the yeah, western the, brown. The, the yeah. dark head and the – man, they're stunning, those ones. Yeah, and you get ones that have got bands all the way down their body as well. And yeah. there's just so much color variation, which is what I really liked about them. I also found them they're super interesting to keep, just yeah. very, very active, inquisitive – like like taipans, taipans are the pinnacle. They're really really cool to keep, but um, I don't have the room for them at home, so I don't keep them anymore. But browns are just, yeah, they're just a different, interesting snake. They've got a bad reputation. It's very very undeserved, and yeah, there's so many colors in yeah. each. Every species is just so many different colors. Um, yeah, so I think the part of the thing with the browns is the reputation. It's just because they cover so much of Australia that they're probably the most commonly encountered snake. Yeah, and most so, snake. Yeah, a lot of snake bites are from eastern browns. Yeah, and everyone's got this story of how the, this brown snake chased them. Like yep, this, they get told one know. every single day at work. <laughs> yep. Every yeah, every day. So you, as soon as you tell somebody you keep snakes or something, like, oh, I had yep. this brown snake chase me. But yeah, you know. But um. But yeah, so the hatchies. When you were raising them, did you keep many back, or did you basically, like you said, you passed a bunch onto like venom supplies, or did you keep any back? Um, yeah, yeah, I was keeping stuff back and raising them up. Um, a few things I've still got that I've bred myself over yep. the years and just grown them up. At one point, I was trying to keep half a clutch back, yep. which is very difficult. It's a lot of, a lot of play snakes to house that's for sure but sometimes i was just growing them to 12 18 months till they'll get in their adult colors coming through just to see what they look like and then getting rid of them from that point just moving them on but yeah i was keep i was keeping some things back i usually would keep a hatchling from each clutch for myself just just in case i lost one as well down the track in case something died and i could replace it or something popped out that was extra special looking i'd keep that and you could see you can easily go for your 20 real quick. Oh, yeah. yeah. Very, very easily. Yeah. yeah. Like if I get a clutch out this season from anything, like I haven't paired any of my lapids this season. But if I did get a clutch out, I'd be over my cap straight away. From so what clutch. happens with that? So say if you have the clutch and you're over your cap, like obviously there's there has to be some sort of, you know, like leeway almost either side. Well, you can Apparently you can apply to get an extension for six months or so. Yeah. To um to pass the animals on, but the new licensing now because they've they've raised the cap to fifty now on one of the yep. licenses, um and there's also a, in Queensland now a breeders license which yeah, okay. allows you to breed things and they charge you an insane amount of money to have it. It's like seven hundred bucks or something for the license, which <laughs> when you're breeding a lapids you don't make seven hundred bucks in a year. No. So you spend, spend seven hundred yeah. a couple of, every couple of weeks on food. Yeah. So um, I forget what I was saying now. Don't know where I was going with that. Oh, just holding stuff back. Oh, the licensing. Oh yeah, yeah, the licensing with the cap. Yeah, I, I'm probably not even going to breed any lapids this year. Yeah, it's just because it will push me over. And yeah, I six months leeway. I think they give you if you do it, but yeah. I'm not 100. percent They can also just say to you, no, you shouldn't have bred them in the first place. Yeah, which is you know. Easy to say. <laughs> yeah, well, that's easy to say. And same thing, like when they capped me, I had heaps of gravid snakes at the time. I had a gravid adder and they told me to destroy my eggs. 
and things. And I was like, and yeah, I had de- had a gravid death adder. I was like, they don't lay eggs. No, that's a lie. <laughs> oh, a lot better. So you want me to kill perfectly healthy babies? Yeah. It's when you feel like just taking them to the parks office and just putting them in a tub and putting them on their bench and saying they're your problem now. Yeah, you kill them. Yeah, you kill them. Yeah. What's it like? What's the, <clears throat> what's it like working with venomous in like the zoo setting compared to private? Like in your uh, I can only speak from where I've worked, but certain yeah. places are more strict than others. There's obviously a lot more OHS regulations and hoops to jump through, and not everyone can just go in and play in the venomous room and handle you things. Can't, can't wear your thongs while you're feeding. Yeah, you can't wear your thongs. <laughs> you got to have your boots on. Usually, yeah, boots, hooks, all that sort of stuff. Um, we are we are uh, hands on. Like we still yep. tail and hooks. Some places don't tail. They'll just use two hooks to try and move things, and it just doesn't work at all. But we'll still tail. Um, we still pin if we have to. Yeah. And we don't use trap boxes for anything. But the way it works is there's sign off sheet type things with building up kind of like a tier system, the same as yeah. the licensing. So you learn to handle red bellies, that type of stuff. And once you're completely competent in that, you'll then get trained on other black snakes, tiger snakes, um, death adders, and then you'll work your way up to brown snakes. Um, coastal tires are at the top for us. Yeah. and But then you've got a tier system of non-caution snakes. So there's caution and caution. So you'll go through your tier system of non-caution snakes, which are the quieter ones, and then you'll start again with caution snakes, which are the more full-on snakes. And at the very, very top, you've got your caution type ends, which is the sign off at the end. Yeah. Well, actually, actually, at the top of ours is cobras. So yeah, okay. Just because they're an exotic, and if you get bitten, something's a bit. It's a bit more extreme. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's all anti venom and yeah all that you, stuff. And yeah, so you will usually handle cobras at the end after everything. What's it else. like? handling the cobras that'd be pretty cool they're just like a black snake really yeah black snake it's a bit more arboreal good climbers just as filthy as a black snake (laughs) (laughs) um yeah when when i first started working with them i thought it was pretty cool and yeah this is cobras i get to play with cobras every single day and now it's just like oh god it's just a shitting machine that has a fancy hood (laughs) (laughs) that's it but we've we've got a fair few of them. I bred them a couple of years ago. Yeah, got a whole bunch That's of babies. Cool. They were shit to raise as well. Because um, they eat um, reptiles, don't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a few of them ate rodents straight up. Um, and we got we had an albino pop out in one of the clutches. Wow. So I persisted to keep that thing alive, and um, it was the worst feed of the lot. I force fed it for over eighteen months, and now it's a champion. Now it's four foot long and. White awesome. and eats anything. But yeah, it's a good looking snake. Yeah. What yeah. other exotic lapids have you got? That's there? all we've got. That's all you've got. Yeah, okay. exo- yeah. yeah. Mon- monocle cobras are the only exotic venomous that we have. We will we yeah. will get more. Um they're few and far between Australia. Anti venom's really expensive because you've got to import it. You've yep. got to go down those whole lines and then yeah, it's another aspect to OHS as well. Yeah. You've got to keep your anti venom on site, refrigerated, all that sort of and- stuff. The, the the expiration date on them is not very long, is it either? On depends on the species. Venom. Depends on the species. Some of them are two, three years. Some of them are five yeah. years. Yeah, the mon- monocle was three years. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, yeah, is expiration on it. So yeah, and then you then you've got to get more, and that's been difficult with COVID as well. Trying to yeah. get anti venom in from Thailand and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah, so it can get no. pretty expensive. I can imagine. But yeah, they're um that's pretty cool. You hatched out an albino one though. Did you know yeah. that they were hats or anything along those lines, or it just popped no, out? No, like- I'd heard through the grapevine through the zoo industry that the monocles that were in the zoos were just this mix of all of sorts of different things that no one really yeah. knew what was in them because they didn't know where they came from originally. Because most of these animals end up they get imported from other countries or they come from confiscations or something along those lines. Yeah. So no one knew, and one other zoo had got a clutch. That they had, they weren't allowed to hatch, so they had to destroy the eggs. And when they cut the eggs open, they had an albino in there as well. So, ah, okay. and those their cobras were related to ours. So I thought maybe there was a chance of it happening. Yeah. So yeah, we got we got one out out of twenty two, twenty two eggs. Yeah. Wow. How does it work? So like, 
do you have to for so being in that type of setting do you have to fill out permits if you want to breed animals or can you just breed exotic animals depends on your state yeah. um we don't have to we can we can breed what we want to it depends yeah. on the species certain species have clauses to go with them of you're not allowed to keep uh, you're not allowed to breed them certain species there's you can only keep them in same sex groups that type of stuff but yeah. with the snakes and the lizards we can sort of breed what we want but yeah. you only breed if you've got a home for it to go for you don't just breed yeah. for the sake of breeding in zoos you just breed yeah. what other zoos need or what you need and that's it you got to be yeah. very responsible about how you do it yeah because you guys trade in between all the zoos and everything yeah yeah. yeah 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 and that's pretty cool but um yeah now that'd be would have been cool to see and now by oh, that yeah well, it actually out. yeah it hatched um i went on holidays i went to wa for a trip and it hatched the day after i left Oh, yeah. <laughs> so i didn't get to see it hatch yeah oh. and, then, and then one of the other fellas that worked there told me it died as a joke uh, <laughs> That'd be yeah. heartbreaking. So, so i went two weeks away thinking it was dead yeah <laughs> uh, so is there like a list so say if you're in the zoo do you put like a list of, of stuff you want like is there like a list like yeah there's a, there's, the there's, da- there's databases where people yeah. have their excess and their their wants and that sort of stuff and you put on there we've got such and such frill neck lizard eggs in the incubator does anyone want them type thing yep. and then people come we want 4.4 or we want 2.1 and that sort of stuff yep. and so you supply what they need and you hatch what yeah. they need yeah that's how it works does that go – can you guys export out of the country as well or is that only certain zoos that can Only do that certain zoos can do that sort of yeah. stuff. So most of that stuff usually goes through like Taronga, Melbourne, yeah. the yeah. big government zoos. Um, Australian yeah. Reptile Park does some of it, but I think it goes through Taronga. I'm not yeah. 100% on that, but I think that's how it works. But we don't. We will – we have in the past like housed animals and grown them up to be sent out, Yeah, but yeah. we don't send them out. We will yeah, okay. we'll house them, we'll quarantine them, we'll do all the medication and then we'll put on a plane it'll go to Sydney, Taronga, and then it'll go from Taronga out. Yeah. yeah that okay. type of stuff. Yeah. yeah we we don't do that very often and we haven't done it in a long time either. Yeah. No, that's pretty cool. But, yeah. Um, yeah, because I wasn't too sure. I knew there was some type of like database and I knew some zoos could, but I wasn't sure which zoos were allowed to. Yeah. But, um, yeah, that's um, – yeah, no, nah, I'd love to see um, – so I've seen the, the cobra they got at the reptile park, but that's about it. Yeah, that's king they've got there. The yeah, king's it's huge. I want them. Yeah, yeah. Are you, are you ours, guys ours are just ours are just monocles. Are you? Yeah, are we're, you allowed we're, allowed, allowed, we're allowed to keep them. There's just not many kings in the country. There's yeah. only a few left. Yeah, and then and you no have to obviously no have breeding them. The enclosure space and everything else before you'd even applied for all that stuff. Wouldn't yeah, you? and you've got yeah. a. You've, when you apply for new species that you haven't kept before, you've got to supply all the enclosure dimensions and photos and you're, yep. you're pretty much applying every time you want to get a new species that you haven't kept before. And if yeah, it hasn't okay. been kept in the state, it can be even more difficult a lot of the time. But Australia Zoo has kings, so they're, they're in Queensland. Yeah. yeah. I've never been to Australia Zoo. That's one place I wouldn't mind going. I would have preferred to go there when Steve was around, but, you know. Yeah. It's one of those things. <laughs> but what do you do, eh? What do you do? Yeah. But um, no, we saw you post up some um, some pictures of your Phil Sapoto enclosures the other day too. Oh yeah, finally finished them. Yeah, they came out really good. Really yeah, I'm pretty happy with them. It's the first time I've tried tile pointing as well. I moved away from the grout and thought I'd better give this give this a go. Dump, dump, dump. What, what, what do like. you think? Yeah, I'm not I'm not sold on it. Yeah, I I found it more difficult than grout. It's definitely harder to get the brush marks out of that's for sure it, it dries a lot slower than grout does so it's st- it sort of stayed to a point where it was wet for a long time and then it missed the stage that grout goes through where you can just rub your hands all over the whole thing and get yep. all the imperfections out of it yep i don't know if that was just me or was what was going on but i end up with brush strokes all through it everywhere <laughs> I, I, I do know what i do know what you mean though because i tried to do that with my boyd's build so i kind of like let it dry for a period of time and i went back to go hit it and all of a sudden it was it was dry completely. yeah that's that's exactly what happened with me as well yeah and then certain parts of it were bone dry and other parts were still sloppy wet yeah yeah you, just depending on the thickness i'd put it on in the in the area yeah 
I, I'm still tempted to try the grout method. Like, I, I'm not 100% sold on the tire pointing either, but it's just super convenient. Yeah, I found, yeah, it's definitely easier. Um, yeah. As far as just painting it straight on, you don't have to mix it and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. You can just mix your oxide straight through your bucket of tile pointing, which was super easy. Yeah. Instead of putting a bucket of grout and then mixing your grout up and then mixing your oxides through that sort of stuff. And But uh, grout sticks to the foam a lot easier as well. Oh, okay. I was, yeah, I was having issues with the tile pointing, especially on the undersides of things. Like, yep. I know what yeah. you mean. Because I was... I was being lazy when I was doing it as well. Often you can just lay the enclosure on its side and paint that way, but I was just trying to do it all upright. Yep. Yep. And yeah, it wouldn't stick properly underneath. And the other thing I found as well is that the acrylic paints don't absorb into it as well. They're sort of just on the surface, whereas with grout, because it grout in. It soaks porous. it in a little bit, it's porous. So when you spray the whole enclosure down with water, you lose a little bit of the acrylic paint with the tile pointing. Yep. yep. Yeah. Whereas that doesn't happen with grout. Yeah, I have to agree with you there 100% because whenever I've done that kind of like black wash or whatever over the top of it, it does seem to – you almost did it, do it like a couple of times to really get it yeah, to stick. Yeah, well, I did, I did black wash on these ones four times Yeah. and to try and get it to where I want it to, whereas with grout, I'd only do it once. Yeah. And it was fine. It just kept – so like draining away off the tile pointing to the bottom and I just end up with a pool of black paint yeah. each time. And then I painted everything and did my final wash coat and was happy with it and done. And what I usually do once everything's dry is I just really heavily spray it all down just to try and get, just to clean it more than anything else. Yep. And all my black paint started coming off. <laughs> I haven't I had like, that oh, happen. <laughs> I was like, I didn't know if it was just me or what was going on. I was like, oh, I don't like this stuff. <laughs> yeah. It's not working how I'm used to it. But it was good for a change, that's for sure. And now no. I've tried it. Definitely come up good though. Yeah, I'm, I'm still happy with where they came, if how they came up. I was going to say, yeah. for anybody that is still listening to this show, go and check out Matt's photos of these Felicipoda enclosures. They're absolutely out of this world. As soon as I saw them, I was just like, holy crap, that is exactly what I imagined doing for my pair that I'm eventually getting. And uh, I turned around to Jason the other day and I was like, "That he just nailed it. Like, that's exactly what I want to do. And I was like, damn it, he got to it first. But, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> no, I was glad. Well, I'm, 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 I'm my own worst critic as well. I'm never, <laughs> so I'm never, ha- I'm never happy with anything I do. I, no, I can definitely same. relate there. I still look at enclosures and go, no, nah, didn't like this, didn't want to do this. You know, I need to try something different on the next one. But you know yeah the big the biggest one will be how it holds up over time now yeah yep yep like once they're 12 months old two years old if they still look the same or whether the paint's all faded away or washed away with this because i got a miss king on them as well yeah yeah see if, see if it um washes the paint away but even with grout over time you start losing your paint yeah it just it just fades yeah especially if you've yeah. got it close to uv uv definitely right. fades UV those water based everything. acrylic paints I have to ask, actually, while we're talking about these enclosures, I didn't actually think about putting the Miss King system on my Felicipoda when I do get them. But after seeing you doing that, I, I just had to ask, like, how often are you actually running that thing? Every three days. Okay. Every three days for 45 seconds. I've got it on. I'm still testing it. I don't know if that's right yet. I've never used Miss King, a Miss King before. Okay. Yep. Um, I, I bought this ages ago for a Boyd's enclosure that I had planned and then just never built. So I thought, oh, I better use the thing because it cost me so much. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, they're expensive. So I, like. set it, so I set it up on that rack and just I, at the moment I've only got the three Felicipoda enclosures hooked up to it and I'm just experimenting right now because I don't want it to be too wet as well yeah. at the same time. They're not something you want to keep just sopping. They're not a dart frog. Well, yeah, well, yeah that's, that's, right. that's exactly why I was questioning it because I was like, holy crap, has he got that thing hooked up to there? Like that's... I would have thought that that would have been, um, you know, too much moisture. But the fact that you've, you, you know, you've now said that it's every three days. I'm like, okay, that yeah, it's not an everyday that. thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I've got it sort of pointed to just one section of rock. Yep. So it just sprays that, and they can it drips down into the plants and everything. But then they can drink from that if they want to. I more put it on there so I could go away on holidays and not have to worry about someone spraying them and mm. yeah, just for my own benefit, really. Yep. Yeah, I might just stay hand misting my ones. Just because yeah, I, I still prefer to hand mess things. Yeah. 
I like the whole idea of hand misting and looking in the enclosure and checking things and not having everything so automated because I feel like you start neglecting things yeah. yeah. when it's like that and you don't notice issues when they pop up. Yeah. Yeah. See, I don't over miss mine. I probably under missed back when I had all my leaf tails. I probably under missed a lot of everything. So I'd still yeah. go through and basically spray every enclosure every every week basically and just check everything anyway. And then I find the soil would – it'd still give the soil time to dry out as well and then me yeah. watering it down would – basically would be watering the plants yeah. in the soil. I think that soil holding humidity is just as important as like for hydration as oh, it's spraying. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. A hundred percent. I actually um one of my gill and I was having a bit of a shedding issue recently and I as soon as I saw it I was like, no, nah, I need to moisten this soil up. It's just too dry for him. And as soon as I, I like literally just poured like, you know, maybe a liter of water in the soil or in the you know, sand and stuff like that. And since then, you can see that he's been rubbing around down in there and all the sheds starting oh, to yeah. come off him. Like, yep. You know, oh, good. even these arid animals need it, you know. Yeah, they'll definitely dig down into it. 100%. Try and get the humidity and hydration that they can. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. One question I wanted to ask you about snakes, I don't know if you want to answer it or touch on is, have you been bitten before? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, Did you want to elaborate, or you don't really want to? Yeah, I can talk about <laughs> I can talk about bites if you want. Hundred yeah. percent. If you're, um, if you're happy to. Yeah. So I've had two. Because it's not something you hear about too much. Because if we had Ross on, and yeah. he spoke about his. Incident. Yeah, a lot of people keep it quiet, and I've been the same. I don't really tell. I don't bring it up unless someone asks. I've had yeah. two bites from what you'd consider medically significant snakes. I've had a few yep. bites from like yellow face whip snakes and that sort of stuff when I was younger. Um, I haven't had a bite for a long time. When I was, I can't remember how old I was, late teens, maybe 20, I got bitten by a big rugosus, northern, uh, sorry, rough scale death adder yep. through, oh. a pillow, through a pillowcase, um, tying the bag up, um, doing everything right. I like so, When you tie a bag, sometimes you can put a hook between the snake and where you're actually tying to sort of flip flatten out the bag and keep the animal away from you. Mm-hmm. And I was tying yeah. it up and the snake come over the hook and hit me in my thumb with one fang. Oh. And I pulled away. I actually ripped the fang out and it was in my finger still come through the bag. So obviously that was nerve wracking. I bandaged up, went to hospital, and in the end I didn't really need to go to hospital. I had a little bit of difficulty breathing and a sore thumb and a swollen hand and that was it. That was the end oh, of it. That was lucky. Yeah, I, I got really lucky. That was that was how I got that bite. Um, I was out of hospital twenty less than twenty four hours later. They just kept me some... in for precautions and then yeah. let me go again. But see, yeah. that's the way. You, like you got bitten, and that's so something. You know, like you see it all the time. People put the hook down on the bag to keep the snake down the back end, so they can tie the knot in it. It's how I've always done it, and how I've taught yeah. people to do it. And it just was just a freak accident, and the snake got me. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, so I got lucky with that one. Didn't need anti-venom or anything. Yeah, so I had a bit of a tightness in the chest, a bit of difficulty yep. breathing and a sore hand and my thumb was swollen for a couple of days and that was the end of that one. Yeah. yeah the, the worst part was ringing my mum to tell her what had happened. Yeah, yeah rang her the next morning after I was fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so once it was all over. So, mum, I'm just like, you know, I got bit last night. But yeah, I'm so I, I'm in hospital. I've been bitten by a death adder. Yeah. I, I still remember. I knew this was going to happen. <laughs> I knew this was going to happen one day. And then about three years after that, and sorry, mum and dad, if you're listening to this, I'm pretty sure I've never told them about this one. Oh, dear. <laughs> I got bitten by an inland taipan on my, on my opposite thumb to what I got bitten by the adder. Oh. and complacency, feeding it with short feeding tongs and it missed the rat and hit my hand. Oh, no. Yep. And was that a full-blown envenomation? It wasn't pleasant, but it wasn't terrible. So, yeah. again, I bandaged up. I went to hospital. I sat in Cairns Hospital for seven hours with a bandage on with nothing happening whatsoever. And... The scariest part of that one was walking in and telling them I'd been bitten by a taipan and the lady behind the counter going, are they poisonous? <laughs> and then and then sitting me down and trying to make me fill out a Medicare form <laughs> before a yeah. doctor come out and rush me in. Yeah. That was a, oh, <laughs> so I um, 
yeah, sat in the hospital bed for seven hours and then they started to take the bandage off and I just got, I was struggling to open and close my eyes to start with and slurred speech was the beginning yeah. of it. And after that, I don't really remember what happened. I woke up the following morning in the hospital bed just with no clue what had happened to me. And yeah, right. yeah and no antivenom. Got through it without any venom. They didn't didn't need to use it. So I don't exactly know what happened. Yeah. Well, in the whole process. It was a bit it was a bit weird. And um yeah, they didn't give me a lot of details on what had actually happened. I didn't know if I just went to sleep or or I passed out or I don't know. I really don't know what happened. And I never really followed it up followed up on it. I just wanted to forget about it more than anything. Well you're still here today. I'm still here today and I haven't been bitten since then. That's the main thing. Yeah. Yeah. Touch wood. It stays that way. Yeah. I've, yeah. I've definitely had close calls. That's for sure. But that's, I yeah. Bear my two, kind of- two bites and both. One was, yeah, an accident and the other one was pure complacency. Yeah. That got me. Yeah. Like, you know, those tiny little tongs you use to feed like a lizard or something? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I was trying I've to feed a, fi- I was trying to fight, trying to feed a five foot inland with, <laughs> with a pair of those, like an idiot. Yeah. Well, look, yeah, you know, yeah. at least you can kind of admit it and you've grown from the yeah, experience yeah, and, right. you know, you're going to go next time you've got those little pairs of tongs in your hand, you're going to be like, not, not today. That's a silly idea. So, yeah, I've never done that again. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah. yeah. But it's yeah. one of those things, like if you're working with, you know, those type of animals, it's one of those things you've got to be prepared for at the end of the day because it can happen in the blink of an eye. Like you said, yeah. the death adder, like you did everything that everyone does puts a hook over the bag and it come over the top of the hook. Yeah, exactly. And a lot of a lot of people I know that work with elapids have been bitten at some point. Yeah. Um, usually through complacency. They never seem to get bitten actually handling anything or doing yeah. the dangerous stuff. They get bitten, yeah, taking a water bowl out or using short feeding tongs or um a, yeah, a fella I work with got himself bitten milking milking a snake and the person holding the snake let go of the snake while he was trying to milk it and the snake pulled out of his grip with the weight of its own body and grabbed him on the side of the hand and that's yeah. how he got himself bitten and yeah that wasn't working with me that was somewhere else but um it nearly killed him so yeah, yeah. It's, it's accidents a lot of the time yeah yeah it's one of those things that's how it yeah. happens and then you get people that have worked in it for in the industry for long long periods of time and they've never had a bite yeah. another fella an older guy that works with us um, he's in his 60s now. He's worked with venomous snakes his whole life. He used to collect venomous snakes for the anti-venom program and he's never had a bite ever, Wow! which is amazing because yeah. he's the clumsiest yeah. person I've ever met in my life. <laughs> <laughs> trips, trips over his own feet, but he's never been bitten by a venomous snake. Well, maybe he's the luckiest yeah. person you've ever met. Yeah, it could be that as well. <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah, yeah and when you're keeping them, it's something you've got to have in the back of your mind that you, you can right. get bitten and it can be very, very bad. And people have had some shocking experiences. People Did, I know, um, like good, good friends, have had bad bites. Yeah. Did the media try and contact you or anything like that? Or nope, nope, nah, knew nothing kind of, about it. Nah, both, good. both bites, nothing about it. And I actually, with the inland one, I actually made comment to them that I didn't want anyone to know. Yeah, yeah. That, that I was in for a snake bite. Because sometimes they put the news out, the mm-hmm. hospitals. Yeah. So, no, that's good. You know. Yeah, the less the media hears about it, the better. Yeah, that's exactly. right. Because they, the they have day, a field day with that sort of stuff. 100%. They have a field day with everything. Yeah. So, no matter what side of the media you Yeah, believe. so I actually, yeah, the inland one I kept very, very quiet. Yeah. I just didn't tell anyone. Only close friends knew about it. That was it for a long, long time. And, yeah, I'm pretty yeah. sure I never told mum and dad. <laughs> now they know sorry <laughs> hopefully they haven't listened this far in <laughs> uh, did you keep the snake long after that or you yeah yeah I had it for yeah. years after that yeah, yeah. Um, I got I got rid of it eventually but you just got longer yeah, tongs I... though for feeding yeah yeah <laughs> I, I had long tongs I just couldn't find them yeah uh, yeah so I got you go. yeah <laughs> Yeah, oh, but that's one thing. Like you hear, of, you don't really hear too much of, you know, bites. There's been a few, I remember watching a short video of someone put up about one of their bites recently, but you don't hear a lot about it. No, it's kept um, very quiet a lot of the yeah. time. 
which I mean, of people are, a lot of people are embarrassed. I was really yeah. embarrassed when I got bitten. Oh, yeah. And then you get the other people that the, are the complete opposite. They're show ponies about it and they see it. That's another thing you often see in venomous community is people see getting bitten as a badge of honor, yeah. which is yeah. complete shit. Yes. A okay. bite is nothing more than a sign that you fucked up. Yep, exactly. That's it. It's nothing, nothing to be proud of. That's right. I mean, we're lucky living where we live that, you know, our medical facilities are top notch. We have mm-hmm. access to anti-venom that's covered by Medicare. Yeah. Imagine getting you bitten know. in the States. Oh, yeah. yeah. Especially, yeah. Like, what? You how much pay. is a vial of anti-venom over there? It depends on the snake, but you could be hundreds and hundreds of thousands exactly. of dollars in debt for the rest of your life. I think I remember reading a story and someone was in like, I think it was $300,000 or something it cost mm. when he got bitten. So, you know, we're like, we're kind of lucky where we are, really. Yes, we are. We're super lucky, and especially um, after talking to Ross, and you know, he he mentioned that minutes to die um, documentary as well. I went and watched it after then, and I'm going, Jesus, it's good, it's good, isn't it? Yeah, it's yeah. a real eye opener, and you go, yeah. we are so lucky to live in the country that we live in, and the fact yeah. that our our um you know hospitals and stuff like that will look after us. Yeah, our bite rates are so low here as well. Yeah. The death the death rate was one to two people a year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. India is getting a million people bitten a year and having fifty plus thousand people die. Yeah, yeah, or, That's or insane. And just the fact that, like, whilst you got that fifty thousand people that die, you've got all that other portion of oh, them that are living all the in ones that are maimed and yeah. yeah, That's horrendous. Yeah, and they- and, the, and the and the side effects that come with some of the species they're bitten by mm. over there yeah. as well. Like, we're pretty lucky. Most of our snakes don't do much long term damage. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah, you get bitten by some of the cobra species and, and different vipers. You're going to need skin grafts and all sorts of stuff going on. Russell's vipers cause impotence. No one wants that. No. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think Jason's had a couple. He's probably good now. But you know. yeah, I don't want to get bitten by a Russell's viper though. But, <laughs> but yeah. But no, it's yeah. It's crazy when you hear because that that was I remember when I watched that that was an absolute eye opener and it just makes you appreciate the kind of the medical system we have here. Oh yeah, we're the lucky country. People yeah. people whinge about it, but yeah, yeah, we're very lucky. Our medical system's very good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and like you've obviously got the places like the that do all the venom stuff as well. So you know, we're pretty lucky to have all that stuff too. So yeah, exactly. Like Australian Reptile Park's doing a good job. Yeah, churning out anti venom or churning out the the raw venom for anti venom and all the stuff that they do at venom supplies as well for pharmaceuticals and whatnot. Yeah, it's, it's pretty important. Hundred percent. Snakes are going to save a lot more lives than they'll ever take in Australia. That's for sure. Oh, that's exactly right. I don't think people realise what type of things that some snake venom goes into that mm. you know saves lives. Everything just a lot, thinks, a lot of know. medication. Yeah, exactly. Venom in it. People don't realize that. So, you know, and without the places like the reptile park and that doing their bit, that's another thing that doesn't exist as well. You know, people mm. risking their lives to milk the snakes. Do you, you do you milk snakes where you guys are for venom? Not, not for anti venom. Um, yeah. We used to do bits and pieces. We don't do it so much anymore for the uni up here, JCU. Yeah. They had a pretty good uh, toxicology department and they did a lot of research on venom, but they've been defunded and that's a whole other story. But. Yeah. We were doing milking for them. I was doing a fair bit of milking for a few different research projects they were doing and a little documentary they did as well. Um, I milked a whole bunch of snakes for that. It's not something I really enjoy doing, yeah, especially for minimum wage. But, <laughs> yeah, I, um, I don't deal well as well when I end up surrounded by venom all the time. I get real puffy eyes and yep. dry throat and few issues with breathing and that sort of stuff if i've been milking snakes for a couple of hours so i try and avoid it if i can seems so to be i've, I've got a bit of an allergy going on i think it's probably just from years and years of just exposure yeah seems yeah. to be a common thing with people that work with venomous snakes yeah is they have I mean, you're just bubble. breathing you're breathing it in all the time yeah. like even when we're cleaning and stuff like i'll go through at work and clean a whole rack of king browns and by the end of it, my throat's dry and I'm sniffling and sn- sneezing is another one that comes a lot when I start cleaning. I start sneezing yep. all the time because when mulga is shit, it's real dusty and you just yeah. breathe it in constantly and obviously that's doing something to your, your system or your lungs. And, yeah, I think a little bit of 
an immune response comes through, a little bit of yeah. anaphylaxis to a point. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I was, I'd imagine obviously the snake shit would contain some types of the protein surely from the venom as well. So, yeah, I'm not, you know. I'm not sure exactly, but I definitely have a reaction to it compared yeah. to when a python shits. <laughs> I wonder about a lot of that stuff that we deal with through this, you know, like it's the exact same. Like I've never been allergic to cockroaches, but after dealing with them for several years, you end up kind of developing a bit of an allergy to them. And I've heard that story over and over again amongst the, the herp community. And I wonder if it's kind of like the same with that sort of stuff, you know, such as feces or whatever. Mm, I think it's just long-term exposure, yeah. breathing it all you know, all the time and your body just gets to a point where it just doesn't like it anymore. Yeah. I noticed it's it the other day with crickets. I was at home feeding crickets and I started getting all wheezy and stuff. I've gone, oh, crap, not these two. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> anyway, bust out the mask yeah. again. Yeah, I, I almost have to wear a mask now when I clean certain species just to try and make my life a little bit easier for the hour or so afterwards where I'm sneezing and have a runny nose and whatnot. But I'm, I yep. stuffed up oh, a couple of months ago now. We got a, had a new King Brown come in and I checked it as you do when it come in, just checked it. I pinned it, was holding it, checking it all over to um, just to make sure it was all good. And then when I released the snake, my eye was itchy mm. and I rubbed my eye with the same finger that I had next to the snake's head holding it. Uh. And, oh, my God, it just my eye blew up like crazy and just so swollen I could barely see out of it and... So I'd, rub, I'd obviously rub some bit of venom residue or something in straight into my eyeball. Awesome. Which it's not the first time I've done it. I've done it a couple of times now, but that was the worst the worst one. I've always got to remember and I always drill it into other people at work now as well. If you, As soon as you head grab any venomous snake, wash your hands straight afterwards. Don't go rubbing your eyes because it's Theoretically, you can get a full envenomation from that if you had enough in your eye because that goes straight into your blood. I'm, stream, not, I'm not sure exactly how it works, but yeah, or so, yeah, something. Yeah, I don't know like if, that, if your imagine. eyes try and flush things straight back out again, because I know yeah. when people get like cobras spit in people's eyes and stuff, they, you can wa- wash it out, and they don't yeah. get envenomated from it. They just get an unpleasant experience for yeah. a couple of hours where everything just blows up, and yeah, oh, yeah, it was. It's not fun. Yeah, yeah, that's one thing. Yeah, that you don't really think of. You know, if you're working, no, and you don't, and you don't think stuff. about it at the time. You no, just go to rub your face or whatever. But or how many times have you done anything? You've, you know, you've been in the kitchen, you're cooking, you've got like chicken juice all over your hand, and you cut the yeah, chicken, rubbing. and all of a sudden you rub your eye. Like, oh, geez, that was stupid. That's just yeah. chicken juice, you know. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's one of those things you don't think of. So, no, but yeah, it's very, very easy to do. But you've got to be on the ball with that type of stuff, and yeah, not get it into your body. Yeah. <laughs> So, washing you know. hands is important, as we probably yeah. all know over the last 18 months. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wash your hands, wear a mask. Wash your hands, wear a mask. Yeah. Oh. yeah you guys wear a mask up there or? Nah. Nah, nah. you guys are like We did. Own, so. We did when we were in lockdown a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Oh, we had two weeks where we had to wear masks yeah. um, in, sho- in shops and that type of stuff, but we don't have yeah. to wear masks now. Yeah. Right. No, we're pretty lucky up here. Yeah. Yeah. We'll hopefully get out of it soon, but, you know, unlike Luke, Luke's a bit further south than me, so he'll be stuck in it for a bit longer, I think. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm heading north as far as I can, but, you know, <laughs> this, this lockdown's cost yeah. me my beard. I had an awesome beard going on, and then all of a sudden I was just like, nah, I'm wearing a mask nine, ten hours a day with a bloody beard. It was just torture. So. <laughs> anyway, what do you do? Yeah. Well, why don't we wrap it up, eh? That was a, a good one. All right. Yeah, sounds good to me. All right. Well, you know, Matt, thanks so much for coming on. This has been an absolute yeah, thanks, awesome Dave. talk. I know that I've kind of st- no. <laughs> been quite happy to sit back and chill out with this one. This has been awesome. But no, I've definitely yeah, no learned problem a lot. at all. Um, yeah, guys, you yeah, can same. find all of Matt and Christy's work at the Natural Herp Keeper on Facebook and YouTube as well. And Matt Somerville's got an awesome Instagram page as well that's well and truly worth following. He always posts up some awesome photos and and build videos or, or, or you know, photos of builds and things along the way. His story's good too. It helped me a couple of days over lockdown. You were posting all those pictures of stuff. I was that like, was that was when we were in lockdown, and I was yeah. bored as anything. And that was, <laughs> yeah, that, that, was, was so only, that was only three days. Yeah, no, that was, yeah. That was oh, really good. three days. 
All right, go back to three days. What's it been for us, Jason? Ten weeks or something now? Oh, I think so. It's well over three months. Uh, yeah. I'm having withdrawals, not being able to go on trips. <laughs> Mate, I'm honestly, while I'm talking about, about trips, if we ever get out of this shit, we're coming straight to your place. So. <laughs> yeah, no problem. No problem. Yeah, I'm already saying to Jason, I'm like, yeah, we're out of here. As soon as we get the green light, we're gone. <laughs> All right, guys. You can keep, keep your filthy disease down there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, we'd like to say a massive thank you to Eric and Owen and the rest of the NPR NPR crew for having us. If you'd like to contact them, it's best to find them at moreliapythonradio.net and email them at info at moreliapythonradio.net. As far as contacting us in our social media platforms, you can email us at australianherptoculture at gmail.com. You can also find us on Instagram and Facebook as well. Make sure to check out our Teespring store for podcast merch. Link is in the Facebook page for sure. Um, to see more of what Jason is doing, make sure to follow him on Facebook and Instagram at The Gecko Effect. For myself, you can find me on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Patreon, and Teespring under Beach of Scaly Beasts. We hope to have you back next week for another episode of the Australian Herpticulture Podcast. Good night, guys. Good night. <laughs>